Well, every Disney Simber, we try to look at the best that Disney has to offer. This year, we're gonna go the opposite route. If you're younger, you might have noticed all these sequels that seem to pop up to popular Disney films that don't really seem to be as good. This is because as hand-drawn films were starting to phase out and CG films were starting to phase in, Disney didn't always have a lot to do for their hand-drawn department. At least, nothing that made them much of profit. However, that seemed to change, though not necessarily for the best, with the direct-to-DVD sequels. For whatever reason, kids just loved to see what was gonna happen next in these movies that really didn't need any continuing stories. And they got a reputation pretty fast of being the worst. You name it, Lion King, Aladdin, Pocahontas, even the Hunchback of Notre Dame got a sequel. As they seemed to make more and more money, they pushed him out faster and faster, and... Well, they have a reputation for being some of Disney's worst material in recent years. For a long time, people have been asking me to look these over, and by God, I didn't want to. But you know what? I'm an optimist, and I'm gonna hold out hope that there's at least one, just one good sequel out there. Is it a fool's wish? Maybe. But I'm determined to get through all of them to see if they're as bad as everybody says they are. I get a feeling they're right, but I should judge for myself. Even though there's surprisingly enough films to almost fill the entire month, there's still one or two that I haven't been able to get. So I'll fill those in with not sequels, but still direct-to-DVD movies that they made. Is there somewhere a diamond in the rough to be found? Well, all through the month of December, I'm gonna find out. Because you demanded it, this is Disney Simber direct-to-DVD sequels. I hope you appreciate what I do for you. So let's go to where this all started. I remember I got the VHS of Fox and the Hound. As soon as you open it up, there was a little pamphlet that said, one of the greatest villains was coming back. You open it up and you saw Disney's The Return of Jafar. Holy smokes, to a little kid, this was amazing. Aladdin was one of the biggest films that ever came out at that time. And Disney never really did any sequels apart from The Rescuers Down Under. So we were beyond excited to see another Aladdin movie on the big screen. As more time went by, though, we realized it wasn't going to be on the big screen, it was going to be direct to VHS. Well, okay, it was still an Aladdin sequel, and it was done by Disney. It still has to be pretty good, right? Well, then we saw the trailer for it, and man, there was a serious downgrade. It was pretty obvious from the first frame what this was. This was Disney trying to cash in on a popular movie, which they've done before, but not usually with a sequel and not usually with such a difference in animation. So, yeah, the hype died down pretty quickly, but we were still kind of interested in seeing it. After all, it was Aladdin, and we wanted to know what evil scheme Jafar had up his sleeve. The film centers around Aladdin getting used to his new palace life, and apparently still unable to put on a shirt, when Iago the parrot escapes from Jafar's lamp and tosses it away, trying to convince Aladdin and the gang that he's changed for good, even though he really just wants a new position of power. On top of that, the genie returns too. Eh, sort of. Robin Williams didn't come back to voice him this time, and it really shows. They got Dan Castellaneta, the voice of Homer Simpson, to do him instead. And to be fair, it's not a bad choice. He can do a pretty good impression. But so much of the genie was Robin Williams just doing his improv, and nobody's as good as him. So immediately, it's a little distracting. But Jafar returns as well as a thief, played by Jason Alexander, accidentally releases him and Jafar as the genie promises to grant him his wishes if he follows through with his revenge. So Jafar plans his evil scheme by framing Aladdin making it look like he killed the Sultan, all while locking up everybody else away. The plot in general is not that bad, and to its credit, Jafar's revenge is actually a pretty good one. But nothing feels as fleshed out as the original. In fact, Aladdin doesn't even seem like the focus. It feels more like the focus is on Iago. He's the one that has the story arc. He's the one that's torn between two places. But in terms of what made the original Aladdin so enjoyable and continuing it here, a lot of it just doesn't transfer over. Whether they didn't have the time or the budget or whatever, it just feels really rushed. Aladdin and Jasmine don't have much chemistry. The genie's not really that funny. The animation, though I know they're trying, just can't compete with the incredible colors and movement that the first one had. Even the songs aren't as hummable. And yeah, way too many of them are given to Gilbert Godfrey. Because that's a voice I want to hear put to music. I remember when my brother and I first saw it, we were more making fun of it than actually getting sucked into the story. But again, being kids, we did put it on once or twice after. 
We kind of accepted what it was, just a cheap knockoff rushed out really fast, and I guess as cheap knockoffs go, it's not the worst, it's just not very good. Its purpose is made totally complete by the ending, where it just seems to end really abruptly. They just say, hey, we want to go see the world, and it just kind of stops. I remember we were scratching our heads what that was about, and then a few days later, the Aladdin cartoon show came out. So, yeah, really all this was was a pilot episode for the Aladdin cartoon. Honestly, I probably would have liked it more if it just came forward and said that's what this was. If they just announced there was an Aladdin show coming out, and this was going to be the first episode, or a couple of episodes tied together like what they usually do with the Disney Afternoon. But no. They had to put it on VHS, slap Return of Jafar on it, and thus we now have to judge it as a Disney movie. Not a theatrical release, but still a sequel to a theatrical release. And in that case, it's pretty bad. What would have made a passable TV pilot is now the beginning of a long line of disappointing DVD sequels. The only part that kind of gets a chuckle every once in a while is Jason Alexander as the thief. But that's because it's Jason Alexander and anything he touches is hilarious. Well, almost. Disney did manage to crush him once. But even when he's saying unfunny lines, he can get a little bit of a laugh out of him. He's just that good. As for the rest, I think the word to describe it is probably... awkward. It's not god-awful, it's not like there was no effort put into it, it's just... awkward. Looking back years later, it's not that big a deal, especially when you know all the sequels that are gonna come out after. But for a bunch of kids that were excited to finally see a sequel to one of the biggest Disney films they've ever seen, it was pretty underwhelming. I know it has a soft spot for some, I was just never one to get into it. But this would only be the beginning of the Disney sequel Suckfest. More were on the way, and there was so much more suffering to be had. With the return of Jafar doing so well in sales and the animated series being a pretty modest hit, it only made sense to wrap it all up with one more Aladdin movie, Aladdin and the King of Thieves. A much better sequel than the last one. Not only is it more cinematic in both the story and its visual style, but it actually puts the focus back on Aladdin and the troubles he's going through. Does it make it good? Well, I don't know if I can go that far. There are still a lot of things that don't work about it. But I can at least say I was genuinely entertained and even kind of impressed. Aladdin and Jasmine are finally getting married. Yeah, I guess they pushed that whole three days thing off a bit. But like he said, he's the Sultan and can change the law, so why even have a law that she has to be married? Oh, who knows. Fairy tales, haha. But Aladdin is feeling sad because he can't invite his father to the wedding because, well, he never knew his father. But that all changes when he discovers his father is actually the king of the 40 thieves and tries to rob the wedding. He's trying to get this scepter that's in the palace that contains an oracle that can tell him where the greatest treasure of all is, the Hand of Midas. Aladdin and his father, played by John Reese davies finally meet up and don't know what to really make of each other. The father is confused about how he made it to a place of royalty, and Aladdin is confused why his father is still a thief. Both want a relationship to Bloom, but both have issues trusting the other, especially Aladdin trusting his father, and we find out kind of rightfully so. The father still wants to find the Hand of Midas and will do anything to achieve it. So Aladdin puts off his wedding and goes back and forth trying to figure out whether or not he wants to help his father and get the treasure, or if he just wants his father back to be, well, his father. And yeah, this is kind of the main problem with the film. I give them credit for tackling the issue of fathers that aren't very good fathers, as it can be a very tough issue. Sometimes can turn over a new leaf, but other times are still caught in this selfish cycle. But here's the problem, Aladdin's father's cycle doesn't really make sense. He says they left Aladdin because he couldn't provide for him and his wife, so he goes and joins the 40 thieves to get his treasure so that, well, he can support them. They clearly find a lot of treasures, but he never comes back. Well, okay, maybe they are building him up as kind of a deadbeat dad. But no, they try to give him these sympathetic moments, which I'm usually for, except it doesn't match at all what he was talking about. Anyone that talks like how this father talks about his son wouldn't do the things that he does. He would be happy to go to the wedding. He wouldn't give a crap about the treasure. In fact, there's really no point to care about the treasure. He can just go and live in the palace. It's all just a pride thing. 
But then at the end, he throws away the treasure, even though he tried so hard to get it, but wait, Aladdin was helping him find the treasure too! Why does Aladdin suddenly care about this? It's so weird to see Aladdin just abandon his wedding and then be like, hey, let's go find this treasure that really I don't care about. But he does it really cheerfully, and the father is all okay with it, and it just doesn't add up. The motivations constantly go back and forth, but not in a way I feel was intentional. If you want to see this kind of story done so much better, watch Adventure Time and Finn's connection to his father. Or even, strangely enough, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and his connection with his real father. These shows get it, and they know how to explain it well. I don't think this one really does. It feels more like they want to do something with Aladdin connecting to his father, but they also want a treasure hunt. So they just kind of smash them together and... Yeah, given the probable short amount of time that they had on this, I guess I can't be surprised what we got. But that still doesn't mean that the heart and focus works, and when the heart and focus doesn't work, the film really suffers, and it's hard to get behind it. But that's not the only problem. The first Aladdin was very good at balancing out the characters. Everybody felt like they got the appropriate amount of screen time. In this one, it's mostly on Aladdin, which is better than Return of Jafar, where it was mostly on Iago. But all Jasmine does is show some support and then mostly stays out of the picture, and all the genie does is want to plan a wedding. Speaking of which, let's talk about the genie. Because Robin Williams is back to voice him, and that's both kind of a pro and a con. It's a pro because it's Robin Williams, and his improvising is incredible. But it's a con because, unlike the first film, they don't always know when to cut him off. Granted, in the original, they do leave the camera on him too long sometimes, but they knew to keep the focus on Aladdin and the story and so forth. In this one, I actually kinda dreaded whenever the genie was gonna come on screen. Even when he made me laugh, it just didn't connect to anything. It's like he comes in and just hijacks the movie when we could be spending more time trying to get the motivations of Aladdin and his father down. Or give Jasmine more time, or make the villain more interesting. Just every time he shows up, even when it's hilarious, it still feels out of place. At first I thought the songs were going to be really good. The first one really had me tapping my feet and kind of humming it afterwards. But then, outside of a duet from Aladdin and Jasmine, they all sound exactly like that. I swear it's like the exact same song in the exact same rhythm, just a few notes are missing or changed. There's very little variety, which is ironic because I know more than one songwriter worked on this. But for all its problems, like I said, there are a lot of good things. William's jokes, though they do go on too long, are still mostly funny. They do at least try to tie in some of the characters at the end, Jasmine throws a punch and the genie gets a few action scenes. And like I said, you can tell they're trying to go that extra mile. Look at some of this animation. This is the same crew that brought the Aladdin TV show to life. TV shows back then didn't have a big animation budget, so for them to come together and pull off something that looks this good, it's really impressive. The angles, the movement, the lighting, the colors. You can tell they knew this was going to be the last thing Aladdin related, and they wanted to try their hardest to make it good. And give them credit for all the action and singing, there are a lot of times where people just sit down and talk, when it's actually needed and welcomed. And those scenes don't feel forced, they flow very naturally. It's just... Once again, the motivations. There's a difference between being intentionally complex and sloppily complex. I feel like this movie had a lot of really good scenes and ideas, but no concentrated narrative to have them connect or flow. So it's a tough call. I don't see it really working as a film, but I'm also kind of happy I saw it. It was visually interesting, it was creative, you could tell it was trying to have a real heart and soul. And I give it credit that I was trying to wrap up both the TV series and the movies. It even ends with the merchant singing the song at the end. Those are kind of nice bookends. I get a feeling if I was a little kid I'd be into it, and as an adult, there's some neat stuff. It's just that none of it ever really connected. But you gotta give props to the directors and animators who you know were on a tough deadline for this. For Disney sequels and shows they're almost never given enough time to be fleshed out, this was a valiant attempt to justly wrap up another Arabian Night. Belle's Magical World. I can safely say that this is the first Disney sequel I've seen during this Disney Simber that is clearly just doing the bare minimum. Hell, I don't even know if it's doing that. I guess with the popularity of Beauty and the Beast Enchanted Christmas, they felt, well, why not do another one? Just something, anything. 
I don't know, throw it out there. And that's what this movie feels like. They just took something, anything, and vomited it up for us. What's the story? There isn't one. Well, no, there, there, there's like four or five. It's not even really a movie. It doesn't really begin, it doesn't really end. It starts off in a lame-ass CG library. It gives us the setup again, how Belle traveled to a castle and comes across all these little characters and the beast, and then it's just a few stories about when she was there. There's a part where she's angry at the beast and they fight over who's gonna apologize first. That ends. Then there's a part about Lumiere being in love with the Feather Duster. That ends. There's one where Mrs. Potts feels left out. That ends. And there's one with a bird with a broken wing. That ends. And then it all ends. That was it. it. It doesn't even wrap up. The opening at least had a narrator saying, hey, this is going on. The ending just, it just stops. It's pointless. It's stupid. There is no reason for it to exist. I is that a movie? I is that what counts as a movie? Talk about false advertising. Look at the cover. It shows Belle in the yellow dress, the famous yellow dress. It doesn't even appear in this. What does appear really sucks. While the animation in Enchanted Christmas wasn't phenomenal, it's still pretty good. Again, you could tell they were trying. They just didn't have the budget to do as well as the first one, but they were really trying to make it look like the first one. Well, it looks like they took the budget of Enchanted Christmas and cut that in half again. Look at everybody. They look awful. This doesn't look like a Beauty and the Beast movie. It looks like Beauty and the Beast the TV show, like what they did with Aladdin the TV show. Was that the idea? Was this going to be a Beauty and the Beast TV show, but then they just scrapped it at the last minute? But they figure, eh, we got four or five of these already done, just slap a movie title on it and say, Belle's Magical World, what's even magical about it? We've seen all this before, there's nothing new, it's just, we're used to this, there's nothing even that magical about it! What is that weird face that has now become a meme magical? Oh, okay, actually that is a little magical. But everything else is totally pointless. If you're just gonna lazily throw these things together and expect it to be a movie, expect it to be judged as a movie. This is clearly just something for three or four year olds. I know what you're thinking. Oh, isn't that like what the original Beauty and the Beast was? No, it was nominated for best film, not best anime film that didn't even exist yet. Maybe it's because of this movie that that category exists. I j j j come on, it's Disney. Is there anything good in it? Well. I like this line. What shall we do? There is only one thing to do. We must scream like bloodless cowards. Ah! This one's kind of cute. Hold on, Lumiere. Considering the option, I have no intention of doing otherwise. I guess the cartoony animation isn't that bad, but the animation when it's supposed to look serious, like in Belle or the Beast, is just pathetic. So, yeah, two lines from Lumiere, some cartoony stuff that, because of the low bar, I have to congratulate them on looking cartoony. But aside from that, no. There's really nothing. If you have a toddler that likes anything, show this. Because they'll like anything. Bell's Magical World, it sucks. I'm on to the next one, bye. Because out of all the Disney properties that people seem to love the most, it was Pocahontas. Clearly we needed a sequel to that. Truth be told, I don't know what's more shocking. The fact that they actually made a sequel to this film that was so historically inaccurate and the majority of audiences didn't like and even many said was the beginning of the downfall of hand-drawn Disney animation? Or the fact that, I can't believe I'm saying this, I actually enjoy this one a little bit more than the original. But if you know what I think of the original, that's not saying much. It's still not good. In fact, there are scenes that are downright cringe-worthy to sit through. But again, as I'm finding out with some of these Disney sequels, there was a legitimate talent going in that I have to admire on some levels. Sorta. The film opens up as stupid as you think a movie called Pocahontas 2 would open up. John Smith is apparently killed by the villain from the last film, Ratcliffe. Somehow, through some very confusing exposition, especially for a kid's film, this means that the white man can go and invade Pocahontas' tribe. But one man named John Rolfe, played by Billy Zane, believes this is unfair. So he pleads with the king to talk to the chief and see if they can work out something between the two. The chief is resistant though, especially seeing how the settlers on their land are not always the best. <laughs> just wait until what happens in the future. But Pocahontas, his daughter, offers to go in his place. Rolf begrudgingly agrees, but thinks there's still some way to turn this into something positive, even if he's not getting the chief himself. Pocahontas is thus introduced to a new world and finds out that if she's going to make any progress, she has to adapt. Thus, she learns their etiquette, their way of doing things, and of course, puts on a pretty dress that they can market to all the Disney princess lines. Let's see, where is it? There she is! 
It's borderline a My Fair Lady story, but keeps just interesting enough that it doesn't become too cliched. And she does a good job winning the people over, showing that they're not all just savages and that they can in fact be very intelligent and very peaceful. But when Rathcliffe brings in a bear to torture, as apparently this was some sort of entertainment in the day, I'm not sure if that's true, but if we allowed bullfighting, I guess anything's possible. Pocahontas stands up for the poor creature, thus driving the king insane for some reason, orders her to be thrown in jail and the attack on her people to begin. And we go right back into stupid territory again. With sword fights, John Smith returning, a romance blooming, even though apparently the person she fell in love with before doesn't count anymore, even though he was kinda still interested, but not. But it's okay because her as the capable strong hero is suddenly seen doing very little in terms of saving the day all of a sudden. It gets so stupid. There's an immense tragedy with this film because, unlike the first one, I didn't always know where it was going. And the way it was written, and the way it was animated, and the way it was paced, it was surprisingly kind of engaging. With the first film, I knew every second, every line, every character, what was going to happen. It was so predictable. You knew the exact message, plot, when things were gonna happen. It was just ridiculous. The only thing it really had going for it was a good color scheme and some nice music. Here, the color scheme and music aren't quite as good, obviously with the budget cut, but there is still a lot of artistic merit. Not only is some of the scenery really nice, and by god I forgot what a good singer the voice actress of Pocahontas is, but I felt the expressions in this were much stronger than the last one. In fact, a lot of scenes of pointless dialogue are taken out, just replaced by how they look. Look at this scene where Pocahontas is saying goodbye to her best friend. They barely say a thing, but look at that! Look at the emotion in their faces! It's remarkable! There's another great scene where she first sees the king and she freezes. They never explain why, they never talk about it, but you just feel the moment. And it's a quiet scene, there's not a lot of in-your-face music, it can actually be very subtle. There's a real conflict between how much of Pocahontas' culture does she give up to adapt and how much does she hold on to. What does she sacrifice for the greater good? That's ten times more interesting than what we got in the last film, where you knew from begin to end what was gonna happen. I really hated how at the end of the last film she didn't go to the new world, she just stayed with her people and I thought, why? Why are you closing those possibilities? Why are you just keeping things separate? But in this one, you do see the lands explored. You see how she reacts to things, and it's interesting, and it's charming, and the romance is nice, and this whole side character that's following her around trying to protect her, he's cool. I like how all the people don't know how to accept her, but they don't immediately shun her. They're just curious, they're unsure, and I don't know, it just felt more relatable. It felt more interesting. Which is both surprising, but also a shame that it started off so terrible and it ends so terrible. I've never seen a movie where the middle was the best part. Again, for what these people had to make and what could have so easily been a phoned-in project, I really felt they were trying. It just didn't work whether it be because of notes from Disney, or they just made the wrong choices, or they didn't think the thing all the way through. But yeah, to its credit, there were much more moments where I was sucked in with Pocahontas 2 than I was with the first one. So I guess if you're really interested in checking out, I would probably say just fast forward to where she's going to the new world and then stop at where they're torturing the bear, because anything outside of that is garbage. But for some strange reason, the middle part of this movie is actually pretty strong. Okay, it's not perfect, but it's Pocahontas 2! I was thoroughly impressed I got anything interesting at all! So I guess I'm glad some parts of it worked. Hell, actually a good chunk of it worked. But it still doesn't work as a complete whole, and that does really damage it. The bad scenes aren't just bad, they're embarrassingly bad. If you're curious, it's not creatively bankrupt. I actually am glad I saw this movie, or at least the middle anyway. But the rest of the Colors of the Wind, sadly, aren't blowing me away. When I started telling people I was doing the direct-to-DVD sequels, a lot of people were saying that Lion King 2 actually was okay. And, yeah, I see what they're talking about. It's probably the best way to describe it. Okay. Is it the first film? No. But is it Belle's Magical World? No. It's not good, it's not bad, it's not incredible, but it's not awful either. It's a perfect middle-of-the-road film that you would probably expect. Simba and Nala have given birth to a bouncing baby girl named Kiara, voiced by Nev Campbell. 
Simba shows her the ropes just like his father did, but it turns out there's a dark, shadowy place that they need to stay away from. No, not the hyenas, now it's the outsiders. A group of lions that like the leadership of Scar and vow to get the lamb back. Their leader, named Zira, is training a lion cub named Kovu to be a cold-blooded killer who grows up, kills Simba, and ultimately takes control. Why him? Well, apparently he's a not descendant from Scar. Yeah, it's a little confusing. He's not his son, but Scar took him in as his own, even though there was never anything in the last movie that showed they did. It's pretty forced and stupid, but oh, it makes the message in the end so much stronger. Kiara, of course, befriends Kovu, but they're told that they're gonna grow up to be natural enemies. A few years pass, and seemingly it looks like Kovu wants to leave his pack, having saved Kiara's life and using that as leverage to join Simba. What they don't know is that Kovu is actually planning to kill Simba when he has the chance. Wouldn't you know it, the two just happen to get along and of course fall in love, and that makes things really complicated. Will love prevail and the two warring sides see their faults? Is this as clear a metaphor for Romeo and Juliet as the first one was for Hamlet? Personally, I think it's clever that they're taking from Shakespeare's second biggest play after his first biggest play. Apart from a few other things, but that's another story. The old characters like Simba, Timon, Pumbaa, and Zazu all feel kind of recycled, even with the original voice actors coming back. But the new characters and their voice actors seem to breathe this very likable life into them. I really like the people they got to play the new parts, where the original actors, while not all bad, just kind of feel like they're doing their usual shtick. Rafiki has a song that doesn't really add much. Simba has a cool dream sequence, but outside of that, he's just kind of the mean father. Nala's practically pointless, Timon and Pumbaa, well, I didn't even like that much in the first film, so now in the sequel we get the table scraps of that comedy. But everyone else really seems to care about this story, even if it doesn't always make sense. It's almost cruel to compare the animation of this one to the original, as the original was one of the biggest animated movies ever made. It's just huge! It's one of the few films where they re-release it, I go to see it on the big screen every time. Now we have that animation budget cut in half, and what do you expect? It's direct-to-video. And as direct-to-video goes, it's not bad. They still have some of that nice line work and try to work in some good backgrounds, but yeah, you're always gonna be comparing it to how good the first one looked, and that's always gonna be a little distracting. But honestly, for what it is, it's pretty decent. The songs I surprisingly kinda like. I even found myself humming some of them after the movie was done. We Are One is a nice melody, Indubendi, while Pointless, is still a nice rhythm. And even the song He Lives In You, I think that's in the Broadway version, isn't it? So you know that's gotta be pretty solid. In many respects, the film doesn't need to exist. The first Lion King truly was a spectacle to look at, and when you do a direct-to-DVD movie that's trying to capture something similar, you know you're not gonna get it, so it almost seems pointless. But if I was forced to make a direct-to-video sequel on The Lion King, this is probably what I would turn into. There is a lot of effort in what I'm sure is not a lot of time and not a lot of money. At least, by Disney feature film standards. Is it awkward at times? Yeah, but it does have enough character to it that even though I felt like I knew what was gonna happen, I still wanted to see it happen. If it was a feature film, I'd probably be a little harder on it, but since it's a direct-to-video movie, I think it's okay. It gave me exactly what I expected and nothing really more, but I wasn't expecting more. If anything, I was expecting less. If you want to see something on par with the first Lion King, you're definitely not gonna get that here, but honestly, I don't know anyone who thinks they're gonna get that. If you want to see sort of a TV sequel with better than TV animation, I think this one's fine. Kind of a middle-of-the-road review, but it's kind of a middle-of-the-road movie. Pop it in and judge for yourself. After a film as 90s as a goofy movie, we can go even more 90s -er with an extremely goofy movie. Yep, because everything in the 90s was extreme! Actually, I'm surprised I didn't spell this with an X because, well, we'll get to that in a minute. I guess in a sense, this is exactly what I think of when I hear direct-to-DVD sequels, or at least what I thought they were going to be before they started doing the big popular movies. Goofy Movie was a modest success, and it did pretty well on VHS, so I kind of figured to do a direct-to-DVD movie. That's just kind of what they did back then. And honestly, you get what you'd expect a movie like this would offer. It opens with Max and his friends getting ready to go off to college. Goofy once again is having a hard time as a loving parent letting go of his kid. 
To its credit, while it is cramming a lot of the cool stuff at the time in your face, it does take some time to actually be a little emotionally considerate. But things go south when Goofy is fired from his job and has to find another one. He's told that the majority of jobs require college degrees nowadays, so enter exactly what you think is gonna happen. Goofy goes to college with Max. And enter pretty much every other thing you think is gonna happen. Max enters a competitive sport, there's a bully that makes fun of him, the preppy cheaters who make fun of the fact that his father is there, who of course makes things worse, Max is embarrassed, their relationship is pulled apart again, and of course it ends with some sort of big sports event. Oh. Did I say some sort of event, like I forgot what it was? No, no, I remember. You couldn't forget for the life of you. It's the X Games. Because they pounded the hell into you. It's beyond obvious that Disney owns ESPN because they plaster that everywhere too. Max's whole goal in this thing is to enter the X Games and win it. It's so weird to see that logo without some sort of parody or satire in there. But no, it's all just one obvious commercial. It's really weird. So, okay, the story is about as recycled as it can get. Is there anything good in it? Yeah, there's a couple things. Like I said, there's one or two emotional moments that are brief, but effective. I feel like the animation is trying to be funnier than it's allowed. Like the bully character. He's animated funny, he's voiced by a funny voice actor, but he's just not given any dialogue or scenes that are very funny. But at the same time, look at him. You kind of want to laugh at him a little bit. Goofy also starts a bit of a romance with this librarian, who's also a little quirky and awkward. And again, look at how she's animated! You do kind of want to laugh at her! But the key word is want, as in, they want you to laugh, they want to get a reaction out of you, but there's just not that much substance there. Some scenes I don't even get. Like Max and the bullies are in this beatnik coffee house, which, do those even exist anymore? I mean, I know there's coffee houses, but come on, these people look like they're out of the 50s, not the 90s. And they all start snapping. That, for some reason, scares the bullies away. I don't get it. This whole movie feels like a really good joke being set up, but for whatever reason, we never quite get the punchline. It kind of holds back and never becomes anything, and just sort of falls into that mesh of typical college movies, except now for kids. Hell, did this inspire Monsters U? Oh, I'm so thankful for that. I don't think these are as entertaining as Disney thinks they are. It just kind of feels like opportunities they're never fully taken advantage of. And speaking of which, I'm just gonna say it, I miss Roxanne! I mean, I know high school, going to different colleges, puppy love, separation, all that stuff, but I'm sorry, they were a really cute couple! Couldn't the movie have been about that? Maybe about them breaking up, or deciding whether or not they wanted to stay together, or going to different schools? You know, actual interesting stuff? Stuff that some kids may need to know when going to college? But nope, it's all about being the sports star and trying not to be embarrassed by your wacky parents. I'd see this only if you're a die-hard Goof Troop fan, or, I don't know, an example of a movie trying to save itself despite a bad script. But now that interests you, it's exactly what you think a directed DVD movie's gonna be. Take it for what's worth and see the X Games yourself. I mean, extremely goofy movie yourself. God, stupid tie-in. So I'm not gonna lie, one of the few Disney sequels that piqued my interest a little bit was Little Mermaid 2. Outside of Return to Jafar, I never saw any of the Disney sequels, they just didn't pique my interest, and I think I was a little too old for them. But when I saw the commercials for this one, about Ariel's daughter who's a human who wants to become a mermaid, I thought, that's kind of a clever idea. Okay, I wasn't expecting much, I know it's a Disney sequel, but I thought there were some possibilities in this. I popped it in, gave it a watch, and yeah, it sucked. Okay, maybe that's too strong a word, but it just felt like an hour and a half of nothing. This story should be so easy to make interesting, but instead you just felt like they're going through the motions. The motions that we gotta see these characters again, we gotta do at least five dumb kids movies cliches that you've seen everywhere, and we have to in no way make the characters feel like their decisions are making the story flow, doing what the story says they have to do. And it's a shame, because like I said, I thought this was a good idea. Ariel and Eric have given birth to a little girl named Melody. She's about to be introduced to her grandfather Triton, but then... Ursula's crazy sister interrupts and threatens to kill Melody unless Triton hands over his magic trident. 
She's defeated, but they decide to follow frozen parents' logic and just keep her away from the thing that she would obviously be very drawn to instead of finding about a million other ways around this. So she can never be told about mer people or the sea or anything like that. In fact, they even build a wall in between the kingdoms. Insert Trump joke here. But Triton tells Sebastian to keep an eye on her, because yeah, that makes sense. And 12 years pass, but everybody acts like it was just 12 minutes. No, really, 12 years later, Sebastian is like, oh, look after her, he said. But wait, why are you acting like he just said that was 12 years ago? Also, Ursula's sister is trying to turn this little guppy back into a shark that was just transformed into a guppy. Why are you still doing this 12 years later and acting like it just happened a few minutes ago? This is the kind of logic this movie runs on. Melody constantly sneaks under the wall and goes into the sea because she loves it so much. She doesn't question that she can talk to crabs and fish and seagulls, but apparently everyone else does and sees her as kind of weird. When Sebastian accidentally gets loose during a party and causes a big scene, she thinks she's to blame even though nobody says she's to blame. And this ruins her big night that I guess could have possibly gone awkward anyway. You see Ariel cross her fingers though we don't know why. She's afraid to dance with this boy though we don't know why. She looks down at her feet like she doesn't know how to dance but this was never addressed. Yeah, we're not even at the meat of the story yet and nothing is adding up. She finds her old magical locket that shows that the underwater city is real, and this convinces her that it's totally rational to leave her home and try to find it. Yeah, again, kinda crazy. She comes across Ursula's sister who turns her into a mermaid, but sadly says she doesn't have enough magic to keep her that way. The only thing that does have enough magic is King Triton's trident, who she now says he stole from her. Because Melody has succumbed to stupidly written kid syndrome like in all bad scripts, she believes her, thinks Trident is the bad guy, and goes and tries to steal from him. Along the way, she comes across C, Timon, and Pumbaa. Yeah, I'm sure they have other names, but it's just Timon and Pumbaa underwater. And she even totally 100% betrays her mother, while also simultaneously dooming the world. Oh god, is this movie stupid. Every second there's another dumb thing that doesn't add up, or something that just makes a character look selfish or idiotic. When Melody finds out that her mother has been lying to her and that her life is a lie, look at this, she runs right past her dad! The dad doesn't even give a shit! Oh hey Ariel, what's up? What? I, attend to your daughter, you idiot! He doesn't even go with Ariel to go find her, he just stays behind and says, good luck! Even Jasmine threw a punch in Aladdin 3, this guy just does nothing! The only characters very occasionally of interest are either Melody or the evil sister. Once in a while they do a good expression on them and hey, Pat Carroll's back to do the voice. She could read the phone book and make it sound deliciously evil. Even the animation is just generic. I can't say it's bad, but nothing really stands out about it either. I remember the incredible expressions that they gave Ariel in the first one. Even when she couldn't talk, the animation on her face was just so passionate and so well done. Here, she just feels like a robot. Look kinda happy, look kinda sad, look kinda worried, look kinda whimsical. It's like talking the notes instead of singing the notes. The Disney sequels that had generic animation always had something that stood out about it. Pocahontas 2 had a lot of great expressions and some good nature shots. Beauty and the Beast 2 has some nice winter colors and that awesome organ. This just seems like it's there to do its job and that's it. I can't totally blame them, I'm sure they were rushed and had to get it out fast but it's just so weird that nothing, friggin' nothing, stands out about it. Even the songs are forgettable, I don't remember a single one. I don't know, I guess I shouldn't be shocked, I mean, it's a Disney sequel, this is what we're supposed to expect, but I really like this idea. I wanted to see more of Melody longing for the sea, I wanted to see more conflict between her and the parents. I wanted her when she finally gets into the ocean to see what a spectacular world it is, like her life is starting anew. But instead of feeling any of that, you're just kind of shown it. You're told what's going on and not experiencing it. I guess it's not awful, especially compared to other Disney sequels. It's just bland and not very memorable. And for an idea like this, especially being a sequel to such a passionate film, you would think even a rushed sequel off of something so passionate would leave some kind of impact. I guess it's fine and corny enough for little kids. But for someone who really loved the beauty, energy, and elegance of the original, for me, this definitely flounders. Of 
Of all the Disney sequels I've reviewed so far, Lady and the Tramp 2 seems to be the closest in spirit to the original. Now that's not saying a ton, seeing how I thought the original was only okay, but to be fair, I think it was meant to be kind of a smaller movie anyway. As soon as its sequel starts, you'd swear you were in the exact same film. The animation is really top-notch and looks eerily similar to the original. I don't know why they throw all their effort into these Lady and the Tramp films. I mean, they're just dogs walking around. Why would you make them look this good? But they do, and it's beautiful to look at. The story itself ranges from generic to actually kind of okay. But again, for a Lady and the Tramp movie, it's not like I'm expecting anything spectacular here. The film takes place not even a year after the original. Lady and the Tramp still have puppies and they seem to be a happy family, but one of them seems to get into a lot of trouble. That being Scamp, voiced distractingly so by Scott Wolf. Yeah, look at this thing, you expect a cute little kid voice to come out of it, something high pitched, but instead, what do we get? But I want to run wild and free like a real dog! God, does that not fit. I go wherever I want, do whatever I please. You know the only reason they went with this voice is so they could get a semi-celebrity in there, and it just doesn't work. But thankfully, the rest of the voice actors aren't that bad, as he wants to run away from home and join a bunch of junkyard dogs. One of them, named Angel, played by Alyssa Milano, takes him under her wing and shows him the ways of the outdoors. But things get tricky when Scamp doesn't know where he belongs, in the home life or the outdoor life. It gets even trickier when it looks like Angel wants a home life and even had a home life, but has had her heart broken many times before. And even trickier when the leader of the Junkyard Dogs has it in for his father. Yeah, it sounds like a semi-reversal of the first film and not really too interesting, but actually they do quite a bit with it. The pacing in this film is a lot slower than other Disney sequels, and it's very welcomed. Much like the original, there's this real elegance and color to it. The backgrounds are just glowing, and when a character goes through something, they don't just say a line and then run away, they actually kind of sit there and let the moment sink in. The songs are actually rather fitting too. Okay, there's an occasional lame lyric here and there, but the style matches the time period perfectly. There's even a ragtime in it. And for these types of songs, they're actually done pretty well. Does it all work? No, there's definitely the cliches that you can see coming, and certainly a groaner line here or there, and I really didn't get what age everybody was supposed to be. I mean, okay, Scamp is supposed to be a puppy, but they get an adult voicing him. Well, okay, maybe he's still a little kid, but Alyssa Milano voices the other maybe puppy. They don't really make it clear if she's a puppy, maybe she's just a small dog, but there's clearly a romance blooming between them, so okay, maybe she is a puppy, but then she talks about how she's been in and out of five families. Five families? You can't be that young and go through five families, but okay, give the benefit of the doubt. Maybe she is, maybe she is still a puppy. The leader of the junkyard dogs, clearly an adult, has the hots for her, always calling her his girl. How does this work? So yeah, little scenes like that and kind of a phoned in climax make it lame at some points. But truth be told, I was actually kind of impressed with how much it felt like the original Lady and the Tramp. They do try to make you feel something. They do show the dilemmas the characters are going through. They do take the time for it. I can't really say it's great because I don't think the first film or this one were meant to be really great. They're supposed to be small, elegant, pleasant little movies. And okay, there's definitely problems that hold me back from liking it as much as the first one. I mean, the first one did have a little bit more of an edge to it. But I think if you're someone that actually wanted to see a sequel to Lady and the Tramp, this'll do you fine. If this is a story you for some reason really want to see continue, I say check it out. It might be an adequate spin-off to dig your paws into. Cinderella 2 Dreams Come True. And if you think that title is unbelievably boring and generic, well, you just summed up this entire sequel. Why do people think there needs to be more than Happily Ever After? That's a perfectly good ending! It's the most popular ending of all time! But no, this thrilling fairy tale needs to continue with the fairy godmother now living in the palace for some reason. I guess she wasn't happy just living as a pile of sparkling dust, however that works. But instead, she likes to read to her mice friends. But oh no, they want to do something nice for Cinderella. This is the major concern of the film. So she recommends that they make a book with all the fascinating stories that happen in the castle. That's right, all three of them. 
because that's all that's worth telling in an hour and a half, and honestly, I don't even know if those are really worth telling. Yep, it's another one of those anthology stories where they just throw three separate stories together, don't really connect them that well, and, well, everybody suffers for it. The first story is about Cinderella learning how to be a princess. She has to learn how to dance right, and dress right, and turn away commoners, and cook boring food. It's hard. But it's okay, some R&B pop songs help her out. Bibbidi bobbidi boo, so this is love, all these classic songs? Hell with that shit that nobody will ever remember. Now we have pop songs, sung by pop singers whose nobody's names they remember even if they sneeze it by accident. You want a real good laugh? Fast forward to the credits and hear their R&B version of bibbidi bobbidi boo I'm not even kidding. It's pretty hilarious. But that's just one of the three boring-ass stories. Jacques is apparently tired of being a mouse, so the fairy godmother turns him into a human. But being a human is really hard, and you can guess where his bullshit goes from there. The last story is about her stepsister, Anastasia, wanting to get a date for the ball. The fact that any of them would go to the ball after everything that's happened is kind of funny, but what's even funnier is that Cinderella is totally okay with helping her out. Yeah, all that sabotaging like you're in her room, all forgiven. Cinderella just wants her to discover how to be her true self. But being her true self is hard! Ah! This sequel in so many ways reminds me of Belle's magical journey, right down to all the stories that they tried to tell and don't really tie them together. Is it quite as bad as that one? I guess not. I mean, the animation is ten times better than it deserves to be. And give it some credit, they tried to tie it together even if it was really loosely, and they kept the stories really short, just down to three. But, big shock, none of these stories are really interesting, and definitely not worthy of the title Cinderella 2. At least Beauty and the Beast didn't call it Beauty and the Beast 3. This is marketed as a direct sequel, and it's obviously not. It's just some stories they threw together. But come on, haven't you ever wanted to hear Cinderella say, This hair? Ew. This hair? Ew. And haven't you ever wanted to see Lucifer wear a Rastafarian hat? Oh my god, what? Oh, it's so stupid! The only thing that's kinda likable in this whole thing, again, aside from the animation, is surprisingly Anastasia is kind of a likable character. I know I made fun of the fact that Cinderella helps her out, and yeah, technically in the story it doesn't really make sense, but the way they animate her and the way the voice acting is done, I do genuinely kinda feel sorry for her. It's the one thing I didn't really expect, and I guess it's actually done kind of okay. No, I feel they did a surprising, if not sporadic, job of suddenly making her kind of likable. But what does it matter? They still put her in the same bullshit stories with the same misunderstandings that suddenly make everybody turn away and go, Oh no, he doesn't love me! All that bullshit. This movie's stupid. This movie's pointless. This movie's dumb. I enjoy the animation, but that kind of makes me hate it even more. This animation could have gone to something so much better. I feel like it's just wasted. Everything is wasted, except the opportunity, because there is no opportunity, so you can't even call it a wasted opportunity. I guess if you have, like, a little, little kid and they just want to see Cinderella in a palace, try on dresses, spin around, all that nonsense, it's fine. I mean, there's nothing really ethically wrong for him or anything. But if you want to show him a fairy tale that's going to enchant and delight, this shoe is definitely on the wrong friggin' foot. Ew! Ugh, oh, this hurts. Hunchback of Notre Dame 2. Of all the films that shouldn't have a sequel, this is one of them. And of all the films that people were telling me to beware of the most when doing these sequels, it was Hunchback of Notre Dame 2. The sad thing about it, though, is even though it is terrible, it's terrible for different reasons than I thought it was gonna be terrible. I mean, don't get me wrong, the story is shit. A circus comes into town and an evildoer wants to steal this super ritzy bell that just happens to be in Notre Dame. It looks like any ordinary bell, but on the inside it's gorgeous and beautiful and full of treasures. Get it? Get it? One of the circus performers is named Madeline, played by Jennifer Love Hewitt. She's working with the evil villain, played by Michael McKean, to be romantically interested with Quasimodo to lure him away from the bell so he can steal it. Of course, a real-life romance blooms between them, but liar revealed! 
It's stolen before she can confess what's really going on. And of course she has a tragic backstory that doesn't really make sense. She was a thief and he's the only one that could look after her, yet really she could move anywhere and nobody would know about it. There's a million other ways around this. But if that seems too heavy and dramatic for you, it's okay. Haley Jo Osmond plays the child of Phoebus and Esmeralda. And this introduces us to one of the biggest problems of the movie, taking mostly Academy Award nominated actors and just having them say stupid shit. It's so hard seeing so many great actors just given a generic bullshit script to work with. And that really is the biggest problem. The script is awful. From the initial setup, you know everything that's gonna happen, what every character is gonna do, when they're gonna do it, it's just ridiculous. And why do we need an appearances can be deceiving story when the first one was already an appearances can be deceiving story? But let's get to the toughest thing to talk about for me, and that's the animation. This was done by TMS, the people behind Akira, Batman the Animated Series, Animaniacs, some of the greatest animation I've ever seen, top five of all time in my book. But I'm not gonna lie, they just don't seem like the right choice here. Not that they can't emulate the Disney style, I mean, they look like the characters fine, it's just that this looks more like a Disney afternoon movie. And what I mean by that is TMS doesn't traditionally use a lot of CGI, Disney does. TMS doesn't usually use colored lines, Disney does. TMS's big strength is not in heartfelt emotion, but more aggressive emotion. Akira is aggressive, Batman is aggressive. Disney can be aggressive, but it's no more for the sentimental side. For example, when a character needs to be still, TMS has them almost completely still. Every once in a while, maybe a little movement. With Disney, they're always somehow moving. They have like a million in-betweeners, so when you're holding on a face, it still looks like there's some movement there. TMS doesn't function that way. It's supposed to be a little rougher. So, the more tough emotional scenes they do fine, like when Quasimodo finally reveals himself. She steps back, she's afraid, she runs off. That they did great. But scenes where it's supposed to feel whimsical and magical and lubby-dubby, that's just not their strong point. I keep expecting to see Wacko Warner come out and bash someone with a mallet. So, the animation is still good, it's just not good for this. Which is a shame, because they do sometimes pick some very bad American projects. So, is anything good? Well, Michael McKean as the villain is actually not that bad. I mean, the villain sucks, he really sucks, but the voice is legitimately kind of creepy, and I never thought I would get that out of Michael McKean. The music's nice. Oh, not the songs, they suck ass. These are some of the dumbest lyrics and most forgettable melodies. I'm talking about the instrumental score. I mean, sure, it's not the first hunchback, but again, direct-to-DVD, we get it, it's gonna be down a bit, but for a direct-to-DVD musical score, it's pretty good. And what do you expect? It's Carl Johnson, the guy who did Gargoyles. That's a great talent. Outside of that, it's not much. It's so hard to see so many great actors, so many wonderful animators, so many phenomenal talents thrown into just the laziest, dumbass script. I don't even know how to fix it. What would you do with Hunchback of Notre Dame 2? It just seems like the first one ended perfectly. I don't know, maybe there's a better writer out there that could make this work? But for me, I'm wishing they gave this movie the Broadway-style ending. Would you like to see a sequel to Disney's Tarzan, one of the biggest summer hits when it came out? Or just three episodes of a cartoon pilot series strung together and saying, that makes it a movie? Well, you got the goddamn ladder. Give Tarzan and Jane credit that it's not called Tarzan 2. No, no, we get that later. It's at least not pretending that this is supposed to be a flowing cinematic follow-up. But with that said, why even watch it? This is another anthology of stories that aren't really interesting, are usually pointless, doesn't have the same animation, doesn't have the same voice actors. They couldn't even get Phil Collins back. They just replay one of his songs in the opening and then have a completely different artist at the end sing them out. Are the stories tied together? Well, about as well as Cinderella 2 ties them together. Jane is excited because it's the one year anniversary of Tarzan marrying her. So she's trying to figure out the best way to celebrate. But every idea she comes up with seems to have a really annoying story attached to it. 
The first story is about her friends coming back from England trying to save her, even though she doesn't need saving. The second is about some evil guys who come to the island who trick Tarzan into trying to show them where some diamonds are. No, no, the diamonds are here! And the third story is about yet another asshole who comes to the island just to make things hard. The moral of the story is anyone who comes to the island not wearing a dress is gonna be a dick! What makes these especially funny is that everybody knows the story that's being told. Oh, I don't mean the audience, though we can guess everything that's gonna happen too. I'm talking about the characters! They literally know everything that happens, they live through it, yet for some reason they're sitting down and talking about it. Some of them don't even end with the same storyteller. One of them starts off with Jane telling the story, and then ends with the elephant finishing it! What the hell happened in between?! As you can tell from the animation, this doesn't look especially cinematic and looks more like a TV series, which it eventually became. This was all just a test to see if kids would watch Tarzan and Jane in several different stories. Well, guess what? People don't want a test. They want a movie. They want a show. Pick one and be it. I guess for a TV show, the animation isn't that bad. I mean, if I saw it on TV, I think it'd be totally acceptable. The quality of the voice replacements, though, rarely sound like the original. In fact, some even sound a little uncomfortable. The only thing more annoying than Rosie O'Donnell's voice is somebody impersonating Rosie O'Donnell's voice. I was there! I saw the apes, all right? Everybody sounds a little off, that is, except for Jane. While you know it's not Minnie Driver, whoever does the voice acting actually brought kind of this unique energy to it. On top of that, Elaine's boss plays one of the villains. Now that's just ideal acting. And sometimes the friends get a little bit of a laugh too. I don't know, I think it's just the people doing the impersonations that are a little odd. Not the worst, just kind of awkward. It's made even more awkward by some of these lines. This one woman clearly has an attraction to Tarzan and talks about how hot it would be if he was in a cage. Jane, perhaps you could put it back in its cage now. Cage? He's got a cage. Uh, this is weird. Nothing about Tarzan and Jane feels big, authentic, or genuine. And if you look on the back or watch a preview, you can catch on to that very quickly. It is what it is, a quick cash-in to see if they can launch this Disney series. It looks that way, it plays that way, is it even worth getting that angry over? It's a waste of time some kids might enjoy, but I think everybody can agree is entirely pointless. I don't know if it's the string of particularly bad Disney sequels I had to sift through the last few days or the fact that this might actually be a good movie, but 101 Dalmatians 2 Patches London Adventure is actually kind of a good movie. I dare even say, on par with the original. Yeah, I can't believe those words are leaving my mouth either. Really? This is the one? It has the spirit of the original, artwork similar to the original, some great updates, some good callbacks. It's exciting, I didn't always know where it was going to go. It's funny, adventurous. Oh my god, I think I came across an actual good Disney sequel! It begins not too shortly after the first one, where we see the Dalmatian plantation is about to be put into effect, so the family is about to move. But one of the puppies, named Patch, is feeling a little out of place. And it's understandably so. When you're the middle child of 101, you can get a little lost. Hungry for his chance to stand out, he sees that a TV dog named Thunderbolt is holding auditions for a new dog to be on his show. What he doesn't know is that his current sidekick, named Lil Lightning, has told him that they're about to kill off his character, so he needs to find a way to prove to the public that he's a real hero. Patch gets roped in as he knows everything about the show, but they seem to cause more chaos and misery than they do save people from it. Meanwhile, Cruella, oh god, how do I even explain this, gets sucked into the art world because she sees a guy who paints a dot. She admits that it feeds her crazy obsession and they just kinda paint dots together. But he seems to be running out of inspiration, or at least she doesn't like the work he's putting out. So she once again tries to kidnap the puppies, only this time she's not gonna make a coat out of them. She wants to paint the canvas with them. Oh my god, that is delightfully psychotic. In fact, I think she's even crazier in this movie than she was in the last one. The funny thing is, as I describe this plot, I realize it's kind of a formulaic plot. Well, for the most part, the art stuff is pretty out there. But there's a lot of callbacks to the original, there's another liar revealed story, another kid feeling out of place, we've seen all this stuff before. In fact, this is about as typical a Disney sequel script as you can get. 
But there's one thing this movie has that those other Disney sequels didn't have. Charm. It's a charming movie. The characters are so likable. The comedy actually gets a few laugh out loud laughs. The pacing is never too rushed. The slow moments are perfectly slow. The fast moments are perfectly fast. The voice talent is especially good. That's Martin Short as the artist. He's really funny as hell. Cruella's voice is hilarious. The hero dog is delightfully full of himself. Jason Alexander is another villain. That's a lot of fun. And they got a real kid to play the puppy, not some adult just doing a high pitched voice like this that's just uncomfortable and weird. The artwork is also really great. These are some very distinct backgrounds that are very similar to the original. I like the original a little better because they were hand painted and these are clearly computer. But by God, they still look great. It can be extreme and over the top, but it can also be kind of subtle and delicate too. I guess the one thing that's missing from it is it doesn't feel quite as big as the original. I mean, the climax is another car chase, and it's just Corilla trying to catch the puppies again. There's even another scene where all the dogs bark to communicate. But in my opinion, the film makes up for it by having better comedy than the first. The first isn't especially funny, it's just cute. This one has a much better sense of humor, and you can tell the writing is trying much harder than it really needs to try, and I love that. I love taking this idea that really should only entertain your two-year-old and actually throwing in some witty dialogue. So, is it a great film? By no means, but you're talking to a guy who doesn't even think the first one was a great film. But the first one was good, and cute, and had some charm to it. This is exactly the same thing. I love the interaction off of these people. I love that cute little pup talking to the egotistical dog. I like that weird artist talking to the insane Gorilla DeVille. I like the husband and wife doing a little counterpoint duet in the opening. It's just, it's likable. It's really likable. It reminds me a lot of the Wallace and Grummish shorts or the Shaun the Sheep movie. It's not like you're slapping your knee at the comedy, but there's just something inventive about it. Something so delightfully innocent yet still intelligent. Like I said, I can't act like this is any phenomenal feat of animation or cinema storytelling, but it's just a nice, enjoyable little movie. A movie that I couldn't predict where it was gonna go. A movie that had a line or two I might actually quote out of context. A movie I legitimately want to stay and watch until the very end. If somebody turned it off, I would go rent it and watch the rest of it. I know that's how movies are supposed to work, but for a lot of Disney sequels, that's not what happens. It's a perfectly entertaining little film. And after all the stinkers I've had to watch, entertaining little film to me equals amazing. Perhaps the biggest crime of Atlantis Milo's return is that despite a very obviously cheap animation budget and, oh, I don't know, obvious identity as a cheap cash-in, which is strange seeing how the first film was not a huge box office hit, it's that at first it actually kind of has an interesting story. Yeah, at first I was kind of sucked in by it. Despite all the bad jokes and awkward drawn scenes and, all right, let's look at the story. Milo is still living with Kida in Atlantis, but all his friends return saying that apparently some sort of Atlantean monster is attacking a bunch of ships. Confused by this, Kida journeys to the surface world, bringing Milo along with her, and they try to figure out if this monster is an actual monster or one of the Atlantean machines or maybe something else, or even someone else. They go on land, come across this creepy village, talk to all these semi-creepy people, and the more and more they find out about this mystery, the more questions it seems to raise. There's actually a lot of talking and even kind of ominous dread, and I mean that in the best way. Even though it wasn't animated the best, I was actually finding it kind of interesting. But here's the thing, when they do find out what's going on and what's behind it, it seems to raise even more questions. Well, that's fine, but we never get the answers. There's questions about where the person who's doing this came from and how he's able to do what he's doing. Is he even doing what he's doing? Is he controlling the monster? Is the monster controlling him? How can he possess other people? Is he possessing other people? It looks like he has to look into their eyes. Wait, now he does need to look in their eyes. How does this work? And just as it's getting interesting, they completely drop the story. Yeah, they defeat the bad guy, and then they go to a completely different story. Now it takes place in the Wild West, and there are these wind coyotes, and I don't know, some guy's shit is stolen, and they have to get it back, but there's this Native American who can control the wind coyotes, and it somehow connects to the Atlantean stuff. 
But it doesn't stop there. It then goes to another story where this crazy guy thinks he's Odin and he steals the spear that has Atlantean technology, which actually kind of makes him Odin now. And he confuses Kida for his daughter, Brunhilda, and shit, this is just another pilot for a TV show, isn't it? That explains why the animation looks this way and why all the stories don't really connect that well. Damn it! At least with Tarzan and Jane, I knew it was gonna be a pilot to a TV show. This, this tried harder! And fooled me into thinking it was gonna be something that tries hard throughout the whole thing! I guess it does technically have an ending, and yeah, actually the ending's not that bad. It even kind of retcons the ending of the first film, but it's weird. When you see the choice she makes, you understand her reasoning, but there's also, like, a ton of dangers that happen throughout this film to go against her reasoning, too. I'm not saying what happens is the wrong choice, I'm saying they never explain the actual dangers that could come along with it, and that's very important to address. <sighs> so yeah, I guess in terms of other technicals, the voice actors are all replacements, and they do a good job. The animation, like I said, is a huge budget cut, but for kinda TV animation, I guess it's fine. Sometimes there's a really inventive idea, like there's this annoying dog that kinda sucks, but he was born in molten lava, so he'll constantly do things like just sleep in a fireplace. That's kinda creative. And again, when they're actually kind of talking about this Atlantean stuff, it is kind of interesting. Kind of like the first film in that respect. But sadly, it just doesn't stay focused, and I don't even know if it was actually meant to stay focused. This was probably supposed to be three episodes that were gonna be connected, like I said, as a pilot of a TV show. A TV show that never got off the ground. I mean, okay, I don't have confirmation of this, but if it wasn't, then this really is the most fragmented direct-to-DVD sequel ever. So I guess it's not awful, it's just not needed and not that interesting through the majority of it. Like I said, with the exception of that first third. But even then, that's not great, it's just telling an interesting story that never really has any conclusion or answers. I guess if you really liked the first Atlantis movie and you just want to see a little bit more of the technology, world, and ideas, you'll get hints of it here. But if you're looking for something more, this is something that should definitely stay sunk. When I first saw the movie Lilo and Stitch, my initial thought was I loved everything with the human characters and thought the alien stuff was only okay. Well, now with its sequel Stitch, I find that strangely enough the human stuff is only okay, but the aliens are actually a little bit more entertaining this time. Does that make for a good sequel? Well, let's look at the story. Lilo and Stitch are enjoying their time getting used to their new alien family. Yeah, remember the Russian alien and the skinny one? They're all living together now. But the alien captain of the guard is furious because he's lost his job and he wants revenge. So he comes across this sort of strange hamster rabbit thing with a German accent. How do all these aliens have Earth accents anyway? And he's sent to get the Russian alien, bring him back, and find out where all the other experiments that he worked on are. Yeah, remember? Stitch is number 626, so where are the other 625? Well, it turns out he's hidden them and Lilo and Stitch come across a few. So it's up to them not only to discover these other experiments, kind of like finding Pokemon in a sense, but also to save their alien comrade. So like I said before, this time it's a little switched around. The aliens in this actually have some really good laughs. This weird rapid gerbil thing is pretty funny, the captain of the guards is trying to be serious but keeps having to come across these annoyances. He even gets this sidekick voiced by Rob Paulson. Even Stitch gets a few more laughs this time. I also really like how this skinny alien is actually really getting used to wearing women's clothing, and he's totally okay with it. Who knows, this might be the first openly transvestite Disney character. Unfortunately though, like I said, the human characters are not as good. They're not the worst, they're just kind of bland and generic. But for me, Lilo is one of my favorite kid characters, and to see her just kind of be like any other Disney generic kid is really kind of a letdown. Even Nani, who had to go through so much in the first film, now just kinda has this side role. I don't know, I felt like coming off of the first film where those connections were so strong and so good, this one is just kind of a background thing. Maybe that's why it was called Stitch, because they just wanted to give him more attention and not as much to the humans, but I like the humans, I liked them a lot, I wish more effort was put into them in this one. But let's also be honest, this isn't really meant to be a fleshed out motion picture. I mean, look at the animation. It looks like a TV show, and yeah, it became a TV show. 
It's a little difficult to be hard on it when it's pretty obvious it's just supposed to be a pilot. And as pilots go, it got a few laughs. The aliens were neat, they were creative, I like the idea of trying to find more of them. In fact, I think that's what the show's about. But yeah, it is a letdown that a character as good as Nani and Lilo are just reduced down to, well, any generic character you would see in a Disney sequel. But I guess if you're just looking for a laugh or two and something relatively harmless, it's fine. It's fine for little kids, I think that's who it was aimed at, and there's nothing really insulting in it. I mean, Lilo and Nani are not done well, but they're totally passable for the audience it's aiming towards. It is what it is, a cute little direct-to-DVD pilot for a TV show, and yeah, you just can't take what comes with that. I wouldn't watch it again, I don't really think I got much out of it even watching it the first time, but for what it's trying to do, it does it okay. Get lost in space and see for yourself. My god, we've had so many Disney sequels they can't even give them full numbers anymore. This is Lion King one and a half. Well, how does that work? It's because this film is a prequel. Eh, uh, kind of. It's focusing more on Timon and Pumbaa and where they came from and all the funny ways they were interacting through the Lion King film without us even noticing it. A cute concept if you like Timon and Pumbaa, which... Uh, I don't hate them, but I don't know if I want to watch a movie with these guys. The story is, not surprisingly, about as generic as it gets. Timon is an outsider among his group, and one day he's put in charge to make sure the hyenas don't attack. Of course, he gets distracted, the hyenas attack, he feels awful, and he has to go find his own way. He ends up leaving, coming across a companion named Pumbaa. They form a bond with both of them being outsiders, and yeah, you just sort of see them insert themselves in random clips. Some are funny, like when you see what actually ended the Can't Wait to Be King song, but a lot of them just kind of seem pointless. You just kind of point and go, tee hee, oh, that's what was going on, ha ha, and half the time there's really no connecting story to it. When the story does come back, it's okay. I mean, there's sort of a nice connection with Timon and his mother. Once in a while, there's an okay laugh. But it's so strange seeing such good animation put to something that's clearly just kind of an in-between prequel. Like I said, they call it One and a Half. How is a movie called One and a Half given this good animation? The only thing I can figure is because it is Lion King and that's one of their biggest properties, I kind of figured to give them the really nice animation, especially when it's supposed to connect back to the original film. But it's Timon and Pumbaa. Why are these great backgrounds being used for Timon and Pumbaa? That is to say, if there was a good story that went with it, like a really great story that surprised you, like Kung Fu Panda or the Lego movie or something that you didn't think was going to be phenomenal but was, then I would understand it. But it's just kind of them inserting themselves into certain parts and not really flowing at all, and I don't know, it just kind of seemed like a mess, but not a god-awful mess, it still looked nice in parts. The only thing I can really say about it is, if you like Timon and Pumbaa, you'll like this fine. It's basically the Timon and Pumbaa movie. I don't hate Timon and Pumbaa, I just don't feel like watching an entire film dedicated to him. But if you do, maybe you'll like it fine. One or two of the songs are surprisingly kind of catchy. I swear that digging melody is going to be in my head forever. And that's about it. Again, I think that's all it was supposed to be. I don't know if it's supposed to be like this grand film or this grand comedy. It's just supposed to be Timon and Pumbaa being Timon and Pumbaa. And if you like that, you'll like this fine. Me? I think the cartoon show was a little funnier, but I guess if you're looking for better animation, this is the one to check out. Give it a watch and see if it's slimy but satisfying enough. Just a heads up everybody, the audio on this might sound a little distorted because I was actually screaming so much I blew out the mic. I'm sure you'll take that as a good sign. Enjoy! Okay, so I've seen a lot of Disney sequels this year, and I've hated a lot of them, but for some reason, some strange reason, Mulan 2, I hate the most. 
Now that's not saying it's the worst. It's not the worst animated, it's not the worst story. The third Beauty and the Beast probably has that distinction. But something about this one just rubbed me so the wrong way and got me legitimately angry. Which is so strange because the first Mulan I didn't even get that into. I mean, I liked it, I thought it was fine, had some good moments and stuff. But something about this one just made me appreciate it all the more when I see what it could have been. How awful it could have turned out. Mulan is back home training a bunch of kids how to be little warrior princesses when her boyfriend drops by and proposes. She of course says yes, but this looks like bad news for Mushu, not voiced thank god by Eddie Murphy this time, but a much more unfunny Eddie Murphy impersonator who's going to lose his job because he no longer has to look after Mulan. So it's up to him to try and split the couple apart. Yeah, doesn't that make him incredibly likable? But come on, this is the sequel to Mulan, this girl that went and defeated this army. Surely some action's gotta be in here? Well, the Emperor of China sees that the Huns are about to attack. Okay, here we go. Now we're gonna get some good sword fighting. He calls in Mulan, and what does he have her do? Escort these three princesses to be married. Yeah, because a marriage will unite these two kingdoms, and thus they can fight the Huns together. Well, wait. That's it? That's really it? I mean, don't get me wrong, the movie makes it very clear early on that it isn't just about fighting and violence, it's about the center and peace and tranquility of the mind, but... Really? This is the plot? Of course they bring in the comic relief from the last film, and they're gonna fall in love with them. There's gonna be this whole thing about, oh, should they marry or should they not, you know, choose your heart, all that blah blah blah. But here's the thing, it isn't like being forced to marry just because you're forced to marry because of tradition. The future of China relies on this. That throws in a completely different element. But Mulan doesn't care, oh, she just wants her girlfriends to be happy, Yee! But to make things worse, Mushu is constantly trying to split up the main couple throughout the entire movie. And I mean the entire movie. He suddenly becomes the most despicable, unlikable character in the world. And what makes it even worse is that it kind of works. The boyfriend just goes off on Mulan in this really uncomfortable animation. By God, what the hell is he even doing? Mulan, at some point through some bullshit, realizes that it wasn't true and she's gonna fall in love with him again and marry him, but then he disappears. So she thinks now she has to marry one of these princes to unite the two kingdoms. The climax? Every dumbass romantic comedy you've ever seen, where the bride is gonna marry the person she doesn't want to marry, and the guy has to come in, confess his love, and some sort of dumb comedic ass happens. I'm just gonna warn you, I'm gonna get into spoiler territory here, but I'm sorry, this is really important to talk about. So, Mushu tries to make everything better by telling them that they don't have to marry. Well, okay, the three princesses marry the men they want, Mulan marries the boyfriend, but... What about China? They're doomed! There's no alliance! The Huns are going to attack! China is officially destroyed because of this! But at least they're marrying for true love! Ooh! It's never addressed what happens after this. I wouldn't make that big a deal out of it. I know, direct a Disney sequel, haha, -ha, but they make a big deal out of it. They keep talking over and over why they can't get married, how thousands will die if they don't join this union, and... In the end, I guess they just let thousands die. It's... it's really awful. There's only one good song in the whole thing, and it's the first song. All the others are either hand-me-downs or repeats. Yeah, they just repeat half the songs. Girl Worth Fighting For comes back, that'll save from having to write another paycheck. The animation, while smooth and colorful, also kind of looks out of place. Mulan in the original had a pretty good range of emotion, but here, all the animation is kind of done like their comic relief. They're too expressive, they're too rubbery. Which, like I said, makes for some really awkward scenes when the boyfriend has to yell at her. Duh, that's disturbing! I don't know what it is, because like I said, I didn't get super into the first film, but something about this was just so insulting and so demeaning. The choices were just so bad, and maybe the fact that they did put in this really good animation just made the insult greater. If it had the animation of, say, Tarzan and Jane or one of these TV pilots, I'd forgive it a little bit more. But you know that they put in a lot of effort. Like, yes, this is the script. This is gonna be Mulan 2. This is gonna be what everyone is gonna get behind. I don't know. It just really friggin' irked me. And all the characters are unlikable, and generic, and bland, and not interesting, or stupid, or just mean-spirited. I can't believe what an asshole Mushu is! And the boyfriend! And Mulan for letting the entire 
everything of China die because follow your heart, which is like, oh my God, what is wrong with this movie? It is a mess. It is awful. It just got under my skin. I hated it so much. Like I said, I can't say it's officially the worst. There's definitely been worse Disney sequels, but this one so far, I've hated the most. It sucks. It really sucks. If I ever had a kid and they wanted to see this, I'd say no. I'd just show them the first Mulan again. <sighs> I don't even know what to say about it. Just skip it. Don't check it out. If you really love the movie Mulan or even just think it's okay like I do, avoid this at all cost. The only thing it did is that made me appreciate the first one a lot more. So I guess I'll give it that. But for everything else, this movie can friggin' blow me. One of the more boring scenes from the original Disney's Tarzan is when you see him as a little kid. That is to say, it should have been interesting. Seeing a half-boy, half-ape trying to figure out where he belongs should be downright fascinating. But instead, it's just some unfunny slapstick thrown in with distracting Rosie O'Donnell ape, and aside from a scene where he puts mud on his face trying to figure out what he is, it's just kind of generic. So as you can imagine, I wasn't especially excited to see Tarzan 2, which is already falsely advertised as not Tarzan 2, it should be called Young Tarzan, it's a prequel. But nevertheless, I put it in, and I'm not gonna lie, I really like this one. Yeah, not kind of enjoyed, not found okay, but was legitimately charmed and entertained by this. Tarzan 2, why Tarzan 2? In fact, why 101 Dalmatians 2? Why are these the two Disney sequels so far I think are actually pretty good? These films should be nothing, but they're actually really delightful. The story, like I said, focuses on Tarzan when he was a little boy. He's once again finding it hard to fit in and figure out where he belongs, but things get even tougher when he's separated from his family and they think he's dead. Convinced that his family and his mother would be better off without him, he leaves the tribe to try and figure out where he belongs. Along the way, he comes across some colorful characters. A pair of brothers, played by Ron Perlman and Brad Garrett, their mother, played by Estelle Harris, and an old ape pretending to be a monster, played by George Carlin. He befriends the old ape and makes a deal that if he keeps convincing everybody that he's a monster, he'll help find out what he is. While that's going on, Turk, the elephant, and his mother all are trying to find him while also trying to escape some beautiful but deadly landscapes. So the important thing to emphasize about this one is that it is a smaller story. It takes place when he's a little kid, so there's a lot of little kid stuff, there's a lot of slapstick, there's a lot of cute humor, but as slapstick and little kid stuff goes, it's really quite charming. I like these characters, I like these two brothers and their mother and how they're all kind of dim-witted but they're kind of threatening too and they kind of go back and forth. I like the old ape and the relationship he shares with Tarzan. I like how they both value the simple things and they kind of do these nice little things for each other and I don't know, I just really felt a nice connection between them. And speaking of which, that's all the movie really is, is just watching these really good connections work off of each other. Most of the voice actors are back, except for the kid roles, and that's including Rosie O'Donnell. She doesn't play the younger version of herself, and thank God, because the voice actress they got is a million times better. It sounds like a real kid, and she works off a of Tarzan like a real kid. It doesn't feel like a forced celebrity cameo, it feels like there's a real friendship. The turmoil Tarzan has to go through is really well done. This is the kind of stuff I wanted to see in the original movie. Now, don't get me wrong, we do get a little bit of it when he's an adult, but this movie tends to dive more into it. The whole film is about him trying to find his identity. That's his goal. That's the beginning, middle, and end. In the other movie, you got this bad guy who's trying to kill all the gorillas, and you got him just doing some dumb comedic stuff with Rosie O'Donnell, and yeah, I liked it, and it's a bigger story, but it didn't always work. There were a lot of times where it fell short, and it felt a little forced. Here, everything kind of flows very naturally. There's no one bad guy, there's no forced musical numbers, there's no awkward comedy. Everything that needs to be done is done perfectly in serving the story. Even the Phil Collins songs, which yes, there are a few, are scaled down a lot. I'm thinking I'm gonna hear them all throughout this movie and they're gonna piss me off, but there's only a couple. 
When the movie needs a quiet moment, it has a quiet moment. When Tarzan's mom needs to just sit there missing her son, it lets her sit there and miss her son. You don't need Phil Collins coming out saying, I'm sad! I'm sad! I'm Phil Collins! Okay, I know a lot of you like Phil Collins, but... God, I don't. I hate Phil Collins. I'm sorry, if you want the proof, watch this movie. The emotional scenes are so much better without his damn music. I don't necessarily blame him, I blame the fact that they chose to just go to a Phil Collins song instead of letting the story just flow naturally. And for a small, quirky kind of movie, everything does really flow here. I really get that Tarzan is trying to figure out who he is, and that's where the focus is. But that doesn't mean there aren't some funny moments, or some quirky characters, or something that's really delightful. Now, does that make it better than the first one? Well, first of all, it's amazing I'm asking that at all, but that's a little trickier because the first one is a bigger story. It's supposed to be big and grand and epic, and, well, this is him as a kid, and it's supposed to be smaller and cute. But it does it so well that I really wish it was in the first film. And I get it, time constraints, you can't do this, but on the other hand, I have no problem believing that this is part of the story. It's not like in Lion King one and a half where you don't really believe Timon and Pumbaa were really there doing that stuff, they just kind of shoehorned it in, it really feels like this was a part of his life growing up. And it's acted well, and it's animated well. The drawings, unlike Mulan 2, felt like they could do the slapstick stuff well and the emotional stuff just as great. In some respects, I would almost rather watch this than the original. Again, I'm not saying it's necessarily better, I'm saying it screws up less than the first one. There's so many times in the first film I remember rolling my eyes like, oh, we're doing this thing, damn it, we were going so well, couldn't we do this instead of that? But here, it does everything that it's supposed to do. And even taking this story that, yeah, we've kind of heard a few times before, but the way they tell it, it seems like you're hearing it for the first time. It's like How to Train Your Dragon, yeah, we've seen that set up to death, but when it's done in a unique and passionate way, it's really enjoyable to watch. I don't know, I'm still a little too close to it to declare which one is better, but yeah, I actually did kind of like watching this one a little bit more than the first one. I liked it a great deal, and I have no shame in saying that. I like the characters, I like the animation, I like the story, I like the backgrounds, I like the acting, I like the music. It's just good. It's a good Disney sequel. I don't know why it's this and 101 Dalmatians 2, but both of these I wouldn't mind seeing again. I'm sure a lot of people are going to disagree with me, and that's fine, but from my point of view, this is a movie I could swing in to watch again. It's interesting how we go from a movie called Lilo and Stitch to its sequel Stitch to its other sequel called Lilo and Stitch 2. Though in a way, I do kind of understand it, seeing how Stitch was obviously a pilot to a TV series like Tarzan and Jane was a pilot to a TV series, but then they come out with Tarzan 2 and Lilo and Stitch 2, which seem more like actual sequels. It's also interesting that these sequels seem to fall into the slew of smaller stories. They definitely connect to the first one, but they're not as big or grand. And, well, with the exception of Mulan 2, they're surprisingly kind of welcomed. I really enjoyed Tarzan 2, I thought a lot of great effort was put into it, and here, this one's not too bad either. Eh, for the most part, we'll get to the bad stuff too. In this movie, Stitch has a glitch. He starts acting all evil and attacking people and doing all sorts of terrible things. But it comes and goes. Eventually it's discovered that this came from a glitch that happened years ago and the Russian alien is trying to figure out how to stop it. While that's going on, Lilo has this big hula competition that she really wants to win, especially seeing how her mother won it years ago. And the rest of the story focuses less on alien encounters and explosions and ray guns and more on them just trying to figure out what to do for their hula contest and keeping Stitch under control. Like I said, a much smaller movie, but for what it is, it's actually alright. In the first film I thought the sisters really stole the show, and in the second film I thought the aliens really stole the show, and here it seems perfectly balanced. Both Lilo and Stitch are a ton of fun to watch. They're just adorable. I love how she's written like a real little kid, and that sort of spreads to Stitch as well. The side characters, though nobody really knew, are a lot of fun to watch as well. Does that make it as good as the first? Well, there are a couple problems. 
There's one or two awkward moments that just come across as odd. For example, the Russian alien knows that Stitch has a glitch and he's trying to put together this device, but he keeps it a secret for some reason. Why would he do that? Shouldn't everybody know that this thing can explode at any moment and he can attack people and seriously hurt them or even kill them? Why is he keeping it a secret? He's sneaking around trying to get household items to build this device to save him, but why doesn't he just tell people? I'll tell you why, because you have to have a scene where Lilo thinks Stitch is really bad, and Stitch does feel bad, and there's this misunderstanding, and it's stupid. It's so friggin' stupid. There's also minor things, like the romance between Nani and the boyfriend is kinda bland once again. I guess they never really got this right. Sometimes there's a read from an actor that clearly needed to be done again. And even the watercolor backgrounds are a little too obvious this time. I don't know, I remember in the first film it was blended a little better, but here it just looks super flat. And I know that's kind of the idea of watercolor, but I don't know, it doesn't blend as well here. Oh, and without giving too much away, there is a huge cop-out ending. There's a really emotional moment, the acting is great, the animation is great, but then suddenly it's just retconned, and they never explain why. It's just... Kind of magic, I guess. Or is it magic? Is it science? I don't know. It just comes out of nowhere and they openly admit they don't know why it happened. Stuff like this that could so easily be fixed is what keeps it from being as good as the original. But still, I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy a lot of it. Again, as smaller stories go. Most of the same actors are back with the exception of Lilo, who this time is replaced by Dakota Fanning. And by God, she does a great job impersonating her. Not just the voice, but the heart, the comedy, the emotion, she really gets it. I don't know if they switched her out because they wanted a bigger celebrity, or if the original actress's voice was changing, but she does a great job. You barely even notice the difference. So even though it's a sequel that doesn't really add much, and yeah, it probably doesn't need to exist, I still have a soft spot for Lilo and Stitch, and if you do too, you'll probably enjoy this. Grab your hovership and check it out. So there's two movies everybody was warning me about when I was beginning doing these direct-to-DVD sequels. One was the third, Beauty and the Beast, and you can rightfully see why. And the second was Kronk's New Groove. This is one of the Disney sequels everybody points to when they want to say how bad they can get. And, yeah, it's not good. It's just a bunch of unfunny stories with unfunny jokes. I guess it's a little difficult to be offended when it's obviously not trying that hard. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's obviously money thrown into the animation, and it moves a lot. But the slapstick is pretty dull, the jokes all fall flat, and I just felt like I watched a whole bunch of nothing. The film centers around the henchman Kronk, played by Patrick Warburton. He's nervous because his disapproving father is coming in to visit, and thus we go into three different stories about, God, what were they again, the evil villain wants him back as a henchman, a romance that blooms with a counselor, and him trying to convince his father that he has everything he's been looking for. All of them are pretty forgettable. I guess on the one hand, I can see why people would be so upset, because a lot of people really liked the first movie. I just kind of thought it was okay. But to its credit, it had a lot more laughs than this movie does. In fact, half the movie is just trying to catch in on those laughs again. Remember the devil and angel in the first one? They do that like 20 times in this! Hell, even the little kids get an angel and devil, and half the jokes don't make any sense! The devil makes fun of the angel because he wears a dress. They all wear dresses! It's the time period! Some of these jokes have great buildup, but then no payoff. When Kronk is about to be reunited with the villain, there's all these jokes about beware the cat, the cat's gonna get you, and all these other feline jokes. Obviously, they're building up that the villain is still gonna be a cat, which is a funny idea, this little cat bossing him around and trying to do all these evil things, that's funny. But no, all she has is a tail. How is that humorous? That's not fun. How much funnier would it be if this whole story happened while she was a cat? A teeny tiny cat, that'd be a lot more humorous. On top of that, there's a lot of great talent that they got for this movie. Patrick Warburton, Eartha Kitt, Tracy Ullman, John Mahoney, John Goodman. These are all funny voices that belong to funny actors, yet none of them are allowed to be funny. They just kind of show up, say the lines, and say them well. They're just not funny lines to say. 
There's even a totally pointless cameo from David Spade as the Emperor. He literally just comes in to say he's in the movie, nothing else. And he'll come in, say a few lines, and then just disappear. Hell, the way I'm describing that sounds funnier than how they actually do it. It's just kind of confusing and awkwardly done. The slapstick is also kind of boring. They just kind of bounce around and move in exaggerated ways, but it doesn't feel like there's any focus or control. There's just big movements going on because that's what kids like to watch, right? Right? So, okay, obviously this is not a good movie. Is it god-awful? Um, I don't know. I guess it kind of depends. Maybe because I've seen so many bad comedies that really hurt after a joke is told, I don't see this one as offensive. It's kind of like a joke you see on Family Guy or an Adam Sandler movie where when it's told and it's bad, it's really bad. Like, you're put in a bad mood. Here, to its credit, the movie seems so determined to get itself over with as quickly as possible that the jokes just kind of fly by. They never linger, there's no awkward pauses, it's just kind of joke, 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 and then the movie's done. It clearly doesn't have that much to say, or what it does have to say, it doesn't try that hard at. So for me, it's just one of those movies that goes in one ear and out the other. Yeah, I wish it could have been better because the villains I thought were the best part of the first movie. But for what it is, it's just bad. Not the worst, not insulting, just bad. If you have little kids that just want to see some cartoons bouncing, I guess it's fine. But if you're a fan of The Emperor's New Groove, or even not a fan, yeah, I recommend just watching a funny Looney Tunes. Dance away from this as fast as you can. Jesus, what is this now? The fourth Lilo and Stitch movie? This is getting crazy. Well, thankfully, Leroy and Stitch is the last of these films, and I say thankfully because it actually kind of goes out on a good note. That is to say, for what it is. I'm finding out more and more some of these direct-to-DVD sequels have to be taken for what they are. For example, I'm gonna judge something like Lion King 2, which is a direct sequel, differently than I am Tarzan and Jane, which is obviously just supposed to be a pilot for a TV show. And at the beginning of this one, you can very quickly see what it's supposed to be. Not a pilot for the TV show, but the ending of the TV show. Now keep in mind, I didn't watch the cartoon show, but I got the general gist. Lilo and Stitch are going around trying to collect all the other experiments, turn them good, and stop the bad aliens from collecting them and taking over the universe. Well, that's exactly where this movie starts off. Lilo and her friends are being rewarded by the Intergalactic Council. They're all given chances to do what they've always wanted to do, whether it be go back to their evil lab or be captain of their own spaceship, but Lilo admits that she's really gonna miss them and doesn't want them to leave. They decide to stay behind, but she realizes she may have forced them to make the wrong choice, and thus she finally says goodbye. They all go their separate ways, but Hamster Wheel, the villain of the last, um, kinda sequel, and the villain of the show, escapes and makes a clone of Stitch. An evil clone, of course, which makes a clone of that clone, and a clone of that clone, and soon there's an army of Leroy's that want to collect all the experiments that were set free, destroy them all, and of course get back to their evil plans of conquering the universe. Much like the movie pilot Stitch, this film focuses again on the aliens, which are once again very funny. Lilo is once again given a smaller role, but I feel they actually do have the emotional connection there. For example, I really like that she becomes friends with Experiment 625, or as she now names him, Ruben. I like seeing these two work off each other. I also really like seeing Hamster Wheel and the Captain of the Guard still work off each other. They're still really funny. And unlike a lot of the Disney sequels, it actually builds up to a good climax. You think it's gonna be another one of those abrupt happy endings where it's not really that big of a climax, it's just kind of a tiny one because hey, they don't have much of a budget? But no, they whip out all of the clones of Leroy and have them battle all of the experiments I'm pretty sure that were in the show. And all of them look different, and sound different, and have these unique powers, and yeah, it's really creative. It's funny, it's energized, it's a lot of fun. Now granted, what ends up saving the day might be a little too silly, I don't know, it's Lilo and Stitch, I get it, kidsy stuff, but the battle before was so much fun, I kinda wish it would just keep going that direction. But that's nitpicking. For what is basically a series finale to a show, it seems like it wraps up everything pretty damn good. The original voice actress of Lilo is back. Again, I'm not really sure why they switched him out, but it's great hearing her voice again. The humorous scenes are genuinely humorous, and even the emotional scenes are kind of well done. 
There's a really nice scene where everyone is saying goodbye, kind of going their separate ways, and then when Lilo has to say goodbye to Stitch, all you see is him looking at the ugly duckling book, putting it away, and they just kind of sit there in silence. That's actually kind of profound. It's simple, but it works. And maybe that's the best way to describe this. Simple, but it works. You can tell from the animation that this isn't going to be the same cinematic quality of the first film or Lilo and Stitch 2, where they put a lot more money into it. But honestly, for the budget they had, I think they did a really good job. Does it have the emotion of the first film? No. Is it going to be remembered as much as the first film? No. But again, I don't think that's what it was meant to be. It's supposed to be a wrap-up of Lilo and Stitch, yes, but more the TV show than the films. And truth be told, this is a really fun send-off. I can't act like it's phenomenal, but for what they had to do, I'd say it's pretty nicely accomplished. Again, it's one of the nice things of being forced to watch some of these movies. I'm a Lilo and Stitch fan, but I never would have checked out the sequels or these TV pilots if I didn't have to do this for a job. But because I have to, I'm glad I checked them out. While none of them quite capture the freshness or the emotion of the first one, they come pretty close sometimes. And they were definitely entertaining throughout the majority of them. Whether you enjoy the cinematic side or the television side, it's nice to know that either way, Lilo and Stitch go out on top. So I'm not gonna lie, the idea of there being a Bambi 2 I surprisingly found interesting. The reason? I really like the first one. I think it's a unique, important, even groundbreaking film. It's a movie that lets the art tell a lot of the story. It doesn't have to over-explain, it doesn't have to create a bad guy, it's just a little slice of life. The sequel had an interesting premise, at least from my point of view. It takes place literally after Bambi loses his mother. Yeah, spoiler alert. I think most of you know that though. Bambi's father requests that somebody else looks after him because he's going to be too busy, but the owl suggests that maybe he should raise him. Thus, the rest of the film is just watching Bambi grow up with his father, who has never been a parent before. Again, no complicated stories, no bad guys, just a little chunk of this one life. In some respects, it's exactly what I was looking for. It's kind of what I thought I would get, kind of what I was expecting, and it's well done. On the other hand though, it is a sequel being made years later to something that was really unique and always just kind of did its own thing. So the idea of trying to recreate it years later does feel a little... off. It's not something you can necessarily blame the film for, it's just kind of what's inevitably gonna happen. The artistry is really good. This movie does everything in its power to recreate the look of the original Bambi, and the feel, and the pacing. And for the most part, it does a really good job. When it has to look like calming winter, it looks like calming winters. When those extreme colors have to come in with the heavy shadows that are somehow red and blue and so forth, they bring that back too, and it's really effective. The backgrounds are never too crisp either, they're just a little blurred, again like the original film. But seeing how they're using artists and technology years later, you can tell it doesn't quite feel, I don't want to say authentic, but a continuation necessarily. You're always aware they're trying to capture the magic and the originality of the first one, and that never ever leaves. It's kind of like the sequel to 2001. It's not a terrible movie, but the first one was just so incredible and just so amazing that you kind of know you're never going to recapture it. And that lingers over the entirety of the film. But on top of that, there are some other problems too. One is, there are songs of the time period thrown in, and they are kind of distracting, which, again, not to act like all the songs in the original Bambi were timeless, but these really do kind of take you out of the environment. Not Tarzan bad or Return to Neverland bad, but still noticeable. The biggest problem, or maybe I should say pet peeve, is the father himself, played by Patrick Stewart. Now, Patrick Stewart is a perfect choice. He sounds just like the original actor. He seems strong and firm, and yeah, this is a really good actor. But I guess the way I always imagined the father was stern and strict and didn't really laugh that much and didn't really show much vulnerability. He was the leader of the force. He couldn't show weakness. He had to be tough all the time. So I figured that would translate over into him being a parent. And while that's what they're clearly trying to do, he does show a little too much vulnerability. He plays it more like the confused parent, the fish out of water, not yuck yuck or anything like that, but clearly he doesn't know what he's doing. 
And of course, eventually he lets his guard down and he goes play with Bambi and has fun. And then he realizes, oh, he was supposed to be stern and strict. And yeah, it's just kind of that thing. It's not awful, it's just not how I imagined that character. There was so much more mystery and strength to him when he only said one or two things. When he first sees Bambi in the first one, just stares down at him and doesn't say a thing. That is so intimidating. I thought that was the father I was going to get. But instead we get lines like, a prince doesn't woo-hoo. Bambi, a prince does not woo-hoo. A prince walks tall, a prince doesn't show weakness, it's stuff you imagine the mother from Brave saying. In my opinion, it would have worked a lot better if they show Bambi as a child with his father, and the father is strict and stern and doesn't show much humanity, and then you cut to years later when he's older. Then he confronts the father about why he was so stern and strict and the effect it had on him. That seems like a time that Bambi would talk about it, but when he cracks at his father because he thinks he's being too mean and he's trying so hard to be everything he wants, it just kind of feels formulaic. And of course the father feels hurt but can't show the emotion, but then he has to see something that Bambi does that proves his worth, and you know it. But again, it's not done bad. It is still just sort of watching Bambi's life, and it's done very similar to how the first film is. A lot of playful moments, a lot of nice artistry, a lot of dark moments, but a lot of nice stuff too. Any problems I have are kind of nitpicky. For example, there's this one deer that's kind of a bully, but he's not the villain or anything, he's just kind of a jerky, fragile kid, and I think they're building up that this is the bully that then confronts him years in the future. He even says at the end, one day we'll meet up again, and I'm thinking, you didn't need to make that connection, I like that this was just a jerky deer. It's the forest, it's nature, predators, you just kind of get it. There's also a particularly messed up scene where one of the hunters in the distance uses a deer call and it sounds like his mother. Mother? I didn't know whether I really liked this or found it really silly, but it is kind of disturbing and uncomfortable, but in a good way. So overall, it is good, it just can't be the first one like I feel it's trying to be. But I really give credit to the directors and artists and writers for trying to be the first one. They didn't have to, they could have just thrown some directed DVD, light animation, oh Bambi and Thumper get in trouble, and just all sorts of bullcrap like that, but they do put in the good pacing, they do put in the character, they do put in the artistry, they do put in the suspenseful moments. In some respects, I didn't want to know what happened to Bambi in between those years. It's kind of like finding out what happened to Batman after his parents died. You'd kind of like it being a mystery. But we got Batman Begins that showed everything that happened, and if it's done well, it's done well. This is kind of the same thing. If they are going to show what happens, this is not a bad version of it. I'd say if you like the first film and are a little curious to see if this is a good follow-up, you'll get an actually okay flick. You can tell a lot of effort went into trying to capture the voice of the first one. And it doesn't go unappreciated. If you like the first movie and are even the littlest bit curious about how this one is, I think you might actually like it okay. Step out into the meadow and take a look. Why was Disney so obsessed with turning people into bears? They did it in Brother Bear, which didn't do so well. They did it in Brother Bear 2, which as far as I know didn't do so well. Even Pixar did in Brave, which also didn't do so well. Did one of the Disney higher-ups just want to be a bear? Well, whatever the reason, we have this direct-to-DVD sequel that, big shock, is not very good. If you saw my review of the first one, you know I like everything in the beginning, everything in the end, and think the middle was really dumb. I guess that's better than this one, seeing how it's mostly dumb and pointless, and forced, and uncomfortable, and oh, let's just get to it. A young woman is about to marry a young man in this arranged marriage, but God literally splits them apart because apparently they weren't meant for each other. Or at least, the sassy medicine woman, played by Wanda Sykes, says that long ago she gave her heart to someone else when they were little kids. Well, of course, that little kid was our main character from the last one, who's a bear now. Thus, the sassy magic Wanda Sykes gives her the speech of the bear. Oh, after getting mixed up with some other wacky animals. That ain't it. Ha ha. So now she can talk with the bear and they have to work together to burn this amulet. 
Of course, they do nothing but bicker and argue and act like they don't like each other, and where is this going? Surely they're gonna hate each other throughout the whole thing, right? Uh-oh, the sassy little cub from the last one, boy, there sure is a lot of sass in these movies, hates the fact that he might be falling in love with her, so he tries to jeopardize the relationship. But, uh-oh, the two moose also want to fall in love with these two lady moose. Sis, sis, what's the plural? I don't care, it's a dumb movie. Will they be able to show them how to win over the ladies while also acting cool at the same time? Oh, wait a minute. They're not acting cool. They should just learn to be themselves and follow their heart. And all sorts of other cliches you've heard a million times but doesn't add anything new to it. That's all it is. It's just cliches from kids' movies, romantic comedies, bland adventure tales, with nothing charming or fresh thrown on top of it. You're just watching these cliches play out and nothing else. Clichés are fine, we need them once in a while, but if you're not gonna add anything or give a unique spin on it, it's just clichés and nothing else. The world they inhabit doesn't even make sense. Like our bride-to-be knows that the main character is turned into a bear, yet at the end, the cub goes into the village and they're like, oh no, they'll kill him. Well, th why would they kill him? Don't they know that he's a guy that was turned into a bear? And even when he goes in there, they're all trying to hunt him down and kill him. And she's like, no, 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 but wait, don't they know? And on top of that, there's a bear wedding at the end where there's all these people and all these animals on both sides. And clearly they know. Why were they hunting each other a day ago? I'd be like, screw you guys. I'm not going to your wedding, bunch of a-holes. All right, so yeah, this movie's pretty stupid, but is there anything good to it? Well, I guess oddly enough, a couple things. One, there's no Phil Collins. Good start. Two, this is probably the best looking out of the Disney sequels I've seen so far. Not only does the animation pretty much look identical to the first film, but the backgrounds are gorgeous. Look at those brush strokes, look at how thick they are. They stand out, but they also blend together just right, and they really help the characters in the foreground stick out while, again, also kind of blending together. On top of that, it also kind of feels the most cinematic. It's paced well, and it's acted well, and it's animated well, and it looks great. Really, the biggest problem is just the writing, but yeah, that's a really big problem. It's just characters acting like they know what to do, and then it turns out they don't know what to do, and then they throw in some catchphrases, and look, the moose says A like Canadians do because get it, they're from Canada. It's just generic and dumb and doesn't add up. I guess I can't say it's the worst because we have movies like Mulan 2 and Beauty and the Beast 3 and such. To me, those are much more offensive. This is just stupid. And once again, not deserving of this great animation and this wonderful background work. I don't know, if you're a fan of the first one, maybe you'll like this one, but it's kind of hard for me to find people that are even fans of the first one. They're just kind of forgotten Disney movies that for some reason they threw a lot of effort into, just not the best writing. Not the worst, but definitely pretty bad. Fox and the Hound 2, here we go. This is yet another film that you think of when you think, ooh, crappy direct-to-DVD Disney sequel. Once again, going back to my original disney Sember review of Fox and the Hound, I thought it was good. You know, not great, but it had some substance there, and it was kind of cutesy, but in the same way Bambi was cutesy, and it needed to be, and it kind of tricks kids into thinking it's a light and fluffy story when suddenly, whoa, it's like a really heavy and dark story. But unlike Bambi 2 that actually tried to keep that same spirit, Fox and the Hound 2 is just an obvious cash-in that doesn't try at all. Well, for the most part, some of the animation is nice, but yeah, that's about it. Todd and Copper suddenly see that the CG circus is in town. Why is it CG? There's no reason, it's just a little cheaper, and yeah, that's just kind of how this movie works. Copper sees that there's a band called the Singing Strays, and he decides he wants to join. So he tries to sing, and they say, hey, you have a good voice, and seeing how our other singer just left, you can join our band. But the other singer doesn't like that she was replaced so quickly, so she joins up with Todd, who wants to get his best friend back, and says, hey, why don't we try to sabotage them? 
so she shows that Copper is not really a stray. <gasps> and suddenly everything is thrown AWOL and they'll never be able to sing in the Grand Opry and yeah, what the hell does this have to do with the original? I'm not gonna act like the original was a classic, but by God, it had some weight to it. It was about prejudice, it was about seeing past hatred, it was about trying to care for your fellow man told through the story with a dog and a fox. Yeah, I know that sounds crazy, but it's because they really tried. They tried to work with the medium they had and the story they had, and they produced something that was actually kind of decent. This is crap. This is nicely animated, actually too well animated, much better than the original, so it's kind of distracting how well animated it is. Crap. It's just a knockoff. A knockoff that's not really trying. I mean, even the idea, Fox and the Hound 2. Unlike Bambi 2, where there was this large gap that could be filled in and could be interesting, Bambi with his father, what the hell can you do with Fox and the Hound 2? I mean, yeah, there is this gap, but what's there to fill in? Really nothing. The two main characters are separated, so there's nothing that fascinating you could put in there. And even if there was something fascinating to put in there, this team wouldn't put it in because it doesn't care. Okay, that's mean. I shouldn't say that. It acts like it doesn't care. What we get as a final product just feels like this cheap corporate shell. If your kids like really bouncy imagery and some music and just kind of pretty-ish animation, I mean, it's not really phenomenal, but it's better than average, which again, kind of makes me feel bad because why are we putting this good animation to this? This crappy story, this is the Mulan 2 of Fox and the Hound sequels. I know there's only one Fox and the Hound sequel, but yeah, you can see where I'm going with this comparison. It's Mulan 2 all over again, except with the Fox and the Hound. It's this really decent, but somehow misguided animation that's not given the proper direction. There's not any investment in the characters. Honestly, there's almost no reason to call it Fox and the Hound. This could be any characters. Any characters could come across this group of singing strays. Actually, why is it even a singing stray thing? Like the crowd is watching saying, wow, it almost sounds like those dogs are really singing. But they are really singing. That's really distracting. Wouldn't like the owner be like, holy fucking shit. I have singing dogs. I have to do something with this. But no, does he think it's a record, but they're really singing? It makes no sense, and I don't usually think about this, but they try to explain it, and they suck at it! Like, everything in this movie sucks! <sighs> I was trying to think if there was anything, anything in this film that was redeemable, and I guess I thought of one and a half things. One is the animation. Yeah, it is decent. The one full scene that I legitimately like is when the owner of Copper and the owner of Todd are both looking for their pets. Now these two don't like each other, but they cross paths and they legitimately wish that the other find their pets. That's a nice scene, that's something that actually would have been nice to see in the original. It's heartwarming, it's kinda decent. Aside from that, it's fluff. It's pure 100% fluff. And don't get me wrong, if this movie just wanted to be fluff, if it wanted to be something on its own and just say, hey, here's something for two-year-olds like baby Einsteins except without the education, that'd be fine. But it's not. It's the Fox and the Hound 2. And when you have that title, you have to have something that at least is trying to represent the original. And this one isn't trying. It has no interest in being the original Fox and the Hound. It just wants to make some fast money, look kind of cute, and then disappear. Well, you know what? You did it. You made some fast money, you looked cute, and you disappeared. whoop de friggin do I guess I can give it credit that just like Mulan 2, it made me appreciate much more what a good film the original was. Now, I appreciate what it was doing and what a great work of prejudice destroying art it was. Or maybe this one was just so bad that I suddenly think it's a masterpiece in comparison. But either way, I guess some good is coming out of it. I'm seeing some more benefit out of the original Fox and the Hound than I did before. But if you want me to legitimately say Fox and the Hound 2 has something good to offer, I say woof. Merry Christmas, everybody! In honor of the occasion, 
gonna take a little break from the Disney sequels and instead look at something a bit more Christmas oriented, but it's still a direct-to-DVD movie. That's Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas. Every year I see this brought out, and I've never really seen it before because I think it came out a little past my time. In that, I love Disney, but it's kind of the basic Disney cartoons. It's Mickey, Donald, Goofy, all learning about the meaning of Christmas while hijinks ensue. I kind of assumed there wasn't that much adult stuff in it, and yeah, it does seem mainly for kids. But for a Christmas movie aimed mainly at kids, I think it's done pretty good. It's an anthology of stories, each dealing with the holiday. The first one centers around Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and them all wishing that Christmas could be every day. Yeah, you know this tale, and you kind of know what comes of it. They get Christmas every day! At first they love it, but then they find they don't, and eventually a lesson is learned. It's pretty standard until they throw in a little bit of a twist, where once the boys get sick of it, they start to act up and make things worse. This results in them seeing the consequences of their actions on the rest of the family, and I don't know, I thought that added a little bit more. At least from what you usually expect of this story, it's kinda nice, and there's a nice little bit about a Christmas card that you think is the throwaway joke, but it makes a return too, and I don't know, it was actually pretty emotional at the end. I liked it. The second centers around Goofy and his son Max. Actually, a much younger version of Max, which I really like, I kinda like the idea of seeing him at a different age. But then again, they probably did that because it's about his belief in Santa Claus. In that, he's starting to doubt. Next door neighbor Pete tells him that there's not a Santa Claus, so Max is bound to find out if that's true or not. The one bizarre twist is that Goofy believes there's a Santa Claus too, and actually ends up staying out all night until he comes. This one is mostly pretty good, but I don't know, I thought the ending was a bit of a cop-out. Not to give anything away, but they do reveal whether he exists in this world or not, and I don't know, I thought you could have done this without a definitive answer. Like maybe they go to bed, they wake up in the morning and find the gifts, and then you don't really know if Goofy did it or if it was just an act. I don't know, I felt there was a really smart good ending to this, and they just kind of do the traditional route. But honestly, the rest is so good, especially with Max trying to make his father feel better, that I think it's fine. The third and final one stars Mickey and Minnie reenacting the Gift of the Magi. Yeah, they actually call it that, I really think that's cool. I usually don't care for Mickey Mouse stories, but honestly, Mickey and Minnie are kind of the perfect people to tell this story. You all know this tale, Mickey wants to get a gift for Minnie, Minnie wants to get a gift for Mickey, but neither of them have a lot of money. So Mickey has a plan involving his harmonica, and Minnie has a plan involving her watch, and alright, I won't give it away in case you haven't seen it, but it's a very decent telling of the story. Mickey and Minnie are the epitome of wide-eyed innocence that it really does make sense to do this story with them. It's a good humble telling. All the stories are tied together with a narration from Kelsey Grammer. The minute you hear his voice doing the whimsical, inspiring thing, you just kinda laugh and giggle at how corny it is, but you also kind of admire how sweet it is. And that's the best way to describe this movie. Corny, but sweet. The animation is really good, especially considering it's just kinda the Disney cartoons. I mean, they didn't have to throw all this money into it, but they did, and they really tried to make it look nice and Christmassy. There's a lot of nice little touches, too, if you know the Disney universe. For example, one of these ornaments is from the second Beauty and the Beast movie. Minnie works for Mortimers, which is this classic Disney villain. And even all the characters are kind of tied into each other, like one person in one story might be the neighbor to another person in another story. It's kind of clever that way. There's even a couple laughs in there. There's one involving Goofy finally spotting Santa Claus that literally made me laugh so hard and so loud, I think my neighbors walking by heard me. I won't give it away, but it was a really funny scene. So yeah, this is obviously something meant for little little kids, but as something for little little kids go, it has a lot of charm and delight to it. It's probably not something I would put on a lot around Christmas time, but I think it's great to show your kids and kind of get them the culture and some of these classic stories, and some new stories as well, with your favorite Disney characters. There's clearly effort that went into it, and the effort pays off. You get three nice, gentle stories that are phenomenal, but are effective. Each one has a legitimately emotional moment, and each one has one or two laughs in it as well. Definitely a nice one to check out around the holidays. There's plenty more Disney sequels along the way, but until then, Merry Christmas and enjoy the best day of the year.
As I get closer to the end of watching all these Disney sequels, I can say that, honestly, the most entertaining out of all of them is Cinderella 3. Yeah. I know, right? The third Cinderella movie? That's ridiculous. Look at this opening. It doesn't even look like it's gonna be anything. It looks like a sequel even worse than the previous sequel. But when I was telling people I was gonna do all these Disney sequels, what I kept hearing over and over is that Cinderella 3 is good. Wait till you get to Cinderella 3. That's a good one. And for the most part, they're kind of right. Are there problems? Yeah, I guess that's sort of to be expected with any of the Disney sequels. Is it my favorite? No, but again, it's, how do I put this, easily the most fun. Like I said before, it opens up kinda corny and chintzy with a goofy little song, not really that impressive, but suddenly the villains return, the stepmother and the stepsisters. They come across the fairy godmother's magic wand, turn her to stone, and start going back in time to make it that the stepsister is the one that has the shoe that fits. Thus, everything is altered, Cinderella is left in the dust, and she doesn't have her happily ever after. The villains are taken to the palace, they hypnotize the prince into thinking that the sister was the one they fell in love with, and it's up to Cinderella to sneak in there and convince him what's really going on without getting caught by the guards or the evil stepmother. On the one hand, this sounds incredibly forced and silly, and yeah, I guess it kind of is, but for such a forced and silly idea, they do everything that they can with it. They realize that the most interesting characters are the villains, and there's a lot of time focused on them. Look at the drawings on them, look at these close-ups, they are just so devious and they love every second that they're on screen, and so do we! I remember there's a scene where Cinderella sneaks in as a servant and she has her face covered and the stepmother is sort of looking at this reflection in the water and she can kind of see her face and I actually went, oh no! Which is amazing! I actually said, oh no, during a Cinderella film, let alone a sequel! That's insane! But on top of that, they actually give a lot of characters who didn't have much development in the other films a lot more development. The king, for example, is more than just a guy who's bouncing up and down saying, eh, give me grandchildren! They make him this really sentimental guy who lost his wife years ago, and so he's passing on this piece of jewelry to the now daughter-in-law, and it's actually really sweet. One of the stepsisters is given a lot more development too, and what makes this so clever is that it actually ties into the second film, Cinderella 2. Yeah, that stupid sequel that nobody cared about. They actually have some things that tie into it. Not only is her character given a lot of depth and a story arc, but they even have characters from the second film that were introduced in this one as well. Remember the woman in charge of the servants? Of course you don't, because nobody remembers the second film, but she's in this. What an incredible touch of detail. Even the prince, who had maybe one line of dialogue in the first movie and I don't know, maybe two in the second one, he was clearly just the eye candy, has a lot more character in this. Well. Okay, not a lot more character, but certainly there is a personality there. He's general, nice, and charming, but you do get to know him a little bit more. Enough that you want to see him get with the right person. The animation is fantastic, and what's so great about it is that it doesn't necessarily try to recreate the same animation from the first film. Bambi 2 kind of fell into that trap, and while it wasn't really bad or anything, you're just constantly reminded that this isn't its own thing. This, even though it's a sequel, does feel like its own thing. The imagery gets a lot more creepy and a lot more creative. There's a scene where she throws Cinderella into this giant pumpkin and it's all gross and disgusting inside. And these vines just grab this horse and wrap around it and then she turns the cat into this evil servant who's laughing maniacally as he's gonna ride it off a cliff and it's just crazy! It's something that you want to see in a fairy tale sequel. It gets a little darker, it gets a little crazier, and it gets a lot more fun. It's like half Cinderella and half Tim Burton. It's just so enjoyable to view. So, okay, this movie sounds great. Is it great? Well, there are a few little problems that hold it back from being a complete piece. And I don't think it's just nitpicking. The biggest one is Cinderella herself. Which is not to say the character is done horribly. I mean, they actually animate her very well and the pacing is good. And there's even a scene when she finds out that everything's been changed where you don't even see her reaction. You just see her place her hand on the door, and that's kind of all you need. Little moments like that are really, really good. But the problem is, in the story, it's kind of like the Little Mermaid. She doesn't learn anything. She doesn't go through an arc. She just kind of wants to get something, and she gets it. I guess it's just kind of a distracting contrast when you see what these other characters are going through and all the changes that they have going on. 
On top of that, some of the morals are a little weird. Like, there's this ongoing thing that when you touch a person's hand, you immediately know if you're in love. And, yeah, I know, Disney, fairy tales, they kind of teach even weirder lessons than that if you really think about it, but I don't know, that seemed particularly odd. For a movie that's really trying to fix the dated problems of the first film, it seems like that was something that was clearly really distracting that they maybe should have taken another look at. On top of that, this movie has three climaxes. Yeah, there's one where the prince saves her, then there's one where she saves herself, and then there's one where she saves him, and it's just kind of all over the place. But they're all kind of fun, too. It's like all this green stuff flying everywhere and this choir going, oh, it's something you can clearly tell the animators and the writers and the directors were having fun doing. And we feel that fun. The hard work and effort is clearly there in a project where it didn't need to be there. They went 110% on something that clearly was just meant to be thrown out really fast, but they really tried. And you can tell they really tried. But yeah, those problems I mentioned before are still legitimate problems. They do kind of focus a little too much on the side characters, and yeah, I know the first film you could argue that too, but the center was still around her need, her want, her going through this endurance to get what was needed. Working hard and finally getting that reward. Here, I guess it's just kind of the same thing, working hard and getting that reward, but we already saw that, so why is that interesting? But in my opinion, the rest is so much fun and so crazy and so enjoyable that I can kind of overlook it, and I think a lot of other people overlook it too. All I can say is what everyone's been saying about it is strangely right. It is really entertaining, and I highly recommend it. I can't say it's perfect, I can't say it's a Disney classic or anything, but it's just a ton of surreal joy. I like how they took something that was pretty pointless and even kind of a dumb idea and turned it into something that was just kind of cool and focused on the elements that were the most enjoyable from the first film. If you want a Disney sequel that doesn't need to exist but is still really, really neat, Cinderella 3 is bizarrely enough the one to check out. Mermaid, Ariel's beginning. Well, okay, this could kind of be interesting. I mean, the animation looks pretty good, and maybe we could see the backstory of some of these characters. Maybe we can see Ursula and how she got where she was, and the interaction with the sisters, and the father, and then mother. Okay, this could be interesting. It starts off showing Ariel and her sisters with her mother and father, and suddenly this pirate ship comes out of nowhere, okay, and apparently kills the mother in a very awkwardly done edit. Seriously, you couldn't just cut the black? This is really weirdly done, but okay, let's keep going. So, the father is so discouraged by the death of his wife and the fact that she loved music so much, they decides to outlaw music throughout the kingdom. Oh, it's this stupid thing. Yeah, the story that you've heard a million times, it probably started with Footloose, and yeah, it wasn't even really good when they did it then. And like that, you know every single damn thing that's gonna happen. Everybody's sad, they all want to sing, but they can't sing. So Ariel goes and tries to find out where she can sing, but that conflicts with the father and they get angry at each other and he's not really bad, he just doesn't see what's really important and they're gonna butt heads and then some stupid last minute villain is gonna come in and try to screw everything up, oh god. No surprises, nothing new, even half the songs you've heard before. They're just sort of reworked versions of famous conga songs. In fact, how do they know the song Shakes in Yora if they live underwater? That, that song wouldn't even be recorded yet! Okay, I'm probably thinking too hard about that, but nevertheless, this is not a very good movie. It's not awful per se, I mean it definitely has awful moments in it, but again, you can definitely get an idea that they're trying to put something decent together. I mean, the pacing's not that bad, it will take moments to be quiet and sort of let the emotion sink in. They do try to give the sisters personalities, but there are six of them, so it's kind of hard to remember which one's which. And like I said before, the animation is damn impressive. I mean, okay, we're not going to see any grand landscapes in this or anything, but just look at the line work, look at the expressions. Look at how flowing and elegant it is. 
for a direct-to-DVD movie, hell, just for an animated Disney movie in general, it's really, really nicely drawn. It's also interesting to see a movie where not only the main characters are good looking. I mean, you know how this works, it's usually the male and the female and they look really pretty or handsome and everyone else is supposed to look cartoony and over the top. Here, the sisters are in a lot of the film and they're all drawn beautiful, so it's kind of interesting just seeing these really good looking characters throughout the entire thing, it isn't just the main lead. They allow for some nice expressions and flowing movements, and it's, like I said, really, really nicely drawn. But that doesn't excuse the fact this is just a dumb story with dumb writing. There's this villain played by Sally Field who's kind of a servant of the king, looks after the girls, and sort of wants to be the second in command. Once in a while she'll get a laugh, I mean Sally Field can be very funny. But to answer the question that everybody is thinking, including myself, no, it's not Ursula. Well, wait a minute, in the first film she describes herself that she used to be in the palace and then she did these evil things and she was thrown out. That's exactly what this character does, and even kind of looks like a younger, skinnier version. I mean, why, why wasn't this Ursula? She even has killer eels that go after the heroes. It was so obviously meant to be Ursula. I was waiting the whole time to see some sort of magic zapped her, or she was transformed or something, or they give her a new name, like Ursula is actually a demeaning name and that's what you'll be called now or something, but no, it's just a completely different character that has Ursula's backstory. Come on, you gotta have Sally Field play a young Ursula, we wouldn't have minded. So yeah, the movie's pretty stupid and makes no sense. I guess if you just have little kids that want to see it just to see nice music and Ariel swimming around looking pretty, it's fine for that. It's not like Beauty and the Beast 3 or Mulan 2 where there's arguably bad stuff for kids in it. I mean, it's harmless. But it's also mindless. Nothing in it is original. Every line, every plot thread, you can point to a million other movies that have not only done it, but have done it better. I guess it's fine if you just want to distract your kids for an hour and a half, but anyone looking for the magic of the original? This one's dead in the water. I looked at the first one, only figures to look at the sequel during this sequel month. It's Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas, and you know, when people ask what's the difference between something that's good for kids yet not necessarily for adults, or bad for kids and not necessarily for adults either, this is a perfect example. The first Once Upon a Christmas was a simple but humble and sweet story. It was expressive, it was kind, it was a little corny, but the effort really shows and pays off. This is a cash-in you can smell from a mile away. Just look at it. I mean, look at it. I know it's direct to DVD, so the CGI isn't gonna be like Pixar quality, but look at it. The first one was direct to DVD too, and you can see all the great drawings, all the great atmosphere, expressions. It was impressive by its own standards. This, even by its own standards, is cheap looking, and lame, and not written well, and heartless, and empty, and just like I said, an obvious cash-in! Okay, well, I guess I should go over all the stories, but that almost seems pointless because where in the first film it was only three stories that seemed reasonable enough, this one, it's like eight. Yeah, they just throw a bunch of them at you, whether they make sense or not. It becomes so much overload that the motivations aren't even established when the stories start. The very first story is just Daisy and Minnie skating. Well, okay, that's fine. But for whatever reason, Daisy tries to sabotage Minnie. Was that in her character? Is that something she's known for? I can see Donald doing that, but nothing about her has ever been established as this egotistical, jealous character. And then Minnie gets really angry too, and she starts fighting back, and it's just this entirely pointless number. There's another kind of mean-spirited story where Donald comes home from work, he's really tired, he just wants to relax, but then Daisy and the boys all want to go Christmas shopping, and they force him to come with. He gets angry because Christmas is being shoved in his face and he just needs a break from it. But he shouldn't be. He's wrong. Much like Christmas with the Cranks, you should just accept everything about Christmas and love it all unconditionally. Seems like a very confused message. On the one hand, I can kind of see what they're going for. Like, you're just gonna need that extra effort to make Christmas special for your kids and your loved ones and stuff. But first of all, they're his nephews, not his kids. I still don't know where their damn parents are. 
Second, you sympathize too much for him. I want him to be by the fireplace. I want him to have his hot chocolate. I don't want him to go out to the store and have all this commercialism shoved in his face. Somewhere there's a sweet, nice idea trying to get out, but it's just lost. There's also this lame number about Max bringing his girlfriend to meet his dad, and most of it's a pop song that he's not really singing. Yeah, you never see his lips move, and the song doesn't really match the atmosphere. They're trying to make it sound like one of the songs you can hear on the radio, but it's not even vague enough to be a song that you can hear on the radio. They're obviously saying the dad's gonna embarrass me. I hope he doesn't embarrass me around Christmas. They can't even get whoring the fake pop song right. Nobody would listen to this on their own, but the character's clearly not singing the song either, so it's just entirely confused. Remember how Santa Claus was a big deal in the first one? Like, Goofy and Max were trying to believe, but they didn't know if they did, but they wanted to believe. That was a whole big thing. In this one, Huey, Dewey, and Louie just mail themselves to Santa. Yeah, I guess he's not really that big a deal anymore. And look at him. Talk about the most generic, forgettable Santa you can imagine. All right, all right, are there any good things about this special? I guess the colors can be kind of nice and Christmassy. Every once in a while, there is a good visual joke or a line here or there. But for the most part, it just feels shallow. I guess it seems silly to be this hard on a little Christmas special that's obviously just meant for little kids, but the first one was just a little Christmas special meant for little kids, and they really did a much better job. They cared. They took the time to write good stories and put in good animation because it felt like the respect of the audience was important. They know they can show little kids anything with Donald and Goofy and Mickey and stuff, but instead they tried to give something really nice and meaningful. And that's felt by the adults as well as the children. This just feels like what it most likely is, a last minute sequel. The first one probably made a lot of money so they had to squeeze out a sequel and this is what we got. A cheap knockoff with little to no heart. I can't say it's as bad as some of Disney's other worst animated films. I mean, I can't say it's Chicken Little or Home on the Range or Mulan 2, but it just feels lazy. And don't get me wrong, I don't know how much time or money they had to put into this, so I shouldn't judge, but it's just how it feels. It feels lazy. Can you show it to kids? Sure. Does it get across any mean-spirited or bad morals? A eh, little debatable, but none that little kids will probably get. It's just a weak Christmas cash grab and nothing more. If your kid's really dying to see it, I guess it's okay to show, but in my opinion, I just put on the first one again. Well, I've already reviewed a ton of direct-to-DVD sequels, why not review this one? Inspector Gadget 2, yeah, kind of an Inspector Gadget-filled month, isn't it? This is a follow-up to the first film starring Matthew Broderick, and though it's not nearly as bad, hell, you just subtract Matthew Broderick from it, it's immediately better. It's still pretty bad. This time, Inspector Gadget is played by French Stewart of Third Rock from the Sun fame. At first you'd think it's gonna be exactly like the first one, with its awkward style and weird in-your-face effects that really, really suck even more this time. But as it goes on, it calms down a bit as it tries to squeeze a story in. Inspector Gadget is having a bunch of glitches and his niece Penny, now in high school, is starting to notice and tells him to go get it fixed. His inventor, however, has an even better plan, make a brand new Gadget. Enter G2, an updated version of Gadget, who seems to be a better officer in every way, not only having no glitches, but no human parts at all. That's right, she's 100% machine. And as soon as Inspector Gadget hears that, he falls immediately in love. Yeah, that's kind of weird slash creepy. She does the typical robot stuff, doesn't understand human emotion, talks like this all the time, that whole jazz. But give her credit, it's a lot more interesting than Dr. Claw escaping. Only this time it's not played by Rupert Everett, and this time you don't see his face. Well, okay, sorta. You see his mouth and his nose, sometimes you see his eyes. Actually, you kinda do see his face, but they at least make an attempt to hide it. This time it's played by some old guy with a really weird voice that sounds nothing like the original Claw, but he has the claw from the first movie, but you don't see his face like the cartoon. It's really kinda confusing. But at least we see Penny snooping around with her dog Brain, and she has the little watch. No computer book, but she has the watch, and they give her a kinda bigger part. 
Then it's weird because she'll tell Brain to look after Gadget, but you know, he's a dog, like a real dog, so he can't do anything like what he does in the cartoon, and wh what is this movie trying to be? The sad, desperate souls that actually liked the first film aren't gonna connect that much with it. Like I said, Gadget's different, Penny's different, Dr. Claw is really different. And the fans of the cartoon are gonna like a few things changed, but it's still clearly not trying hard enough to be the cartoon. It's almost like the filmmakers got all these really angry notes and they said, oh, okay, we're not supposed to see Claw's face, Penny's supposed to snoop around, Brain's supposed to help. Okay, we'll do that. But then for some reason, they still never looked at the cartoon. They didn't see how you're supposed to do it. And don't get me wrong, the cartoon's weird. I think it's kind of debatable whether or not it's actually even good. But it was kind of entertaining and interesting and had kind of its own unique formula and its own kind of awkward charm. This doesn't. While French Stewart is definitely a better gadget than Matthew Broderick, he still doesn't seem like he's being told the right things to do. That is to say, comedically, his line delivery just seems off. It doesn't sound like he's trying to impersonate Don Adams or do his own thing, it's just kind of weird. All my years of crime fighting Gadget Mobile is that it's always the most quiet. Right before the criminal strike. On top of that, a lot of the comedy is off. Every once in a while I get a little bit of a giggle, like I like how the bad guys are sneaking in as this band and none of the instruments they're playing matches the music that's being played behind them on an obvious recording. In fact, it's sitar music and there's not even a sitar in there. That's funny. Once in a while you'll get a little moment like that. The effects are really awful. At the very least in the first film, they tried to mix some practical effects with the CG. Here, it's all CG. And it's we don't give a crap CG. Look at this scene where this rope is supposed to wrap around Gadget. What the hell am I even looking at? It looks like one of those old Marvel hologram cards. It doesn't even look solid. The acting, pretty much from everybody, either ranges from bad to just off. I don't know what direction they were given, but it was always kind of the wrong direction. Everyone says their lines just a little strangely, and that's already made odd by the fact that they already have strange voices. The only time the acting does work a little bit is when French Stewart has to have an emotional moment. I know that sounds strange, and there aren't that many of them, but when he genuinely seems confused or sad or upset, it's done in such a brainless way that he still kind of seems sympathetic. I can't explain it, there's something weirdly genuine about it. Aside from that, I don't know what this film is going for. It'll have the little mad logo like from the cartoon, but even that looks a little different. Why? You have the rights to Inspector Gadget, just go all out there. So okay, is it as bad as the first one? No. There's very few things that are as bad as the first one. The first one was painful. The first one, every single time a joke was made or somebody gave a weird look, it hurt. The first film hurt. This film doesn't hurt, it's just dumb. It's a dumb movie. It'll probably be forgotten the minute you watch it. The first film leaves scars, scars that will never heal. This is just a lame flick. So if for some reason your kid wants to see it, you can go ahead and show it, there's nothing that's gonna screw him up. But for anyone else, if you have any interest in seeing this movie, go go gadget, don't. Ever since the movie Toy Story came out, I, as well as I'm assuming a lot of other people, really wanted a Buzz Lightyear show. Everything he described about his world just sounded so much fun. Flying through space, defeating the evil Emperor Zerg, fighting aliens, blasting things, blowing them up. It sounded like a show that practically wrote itself. Well, Buzz Lightyear A Star Command was the pilot film to get that show going. And as pilot films go, it is pretty much just an hour and a half long Saturday morning cartoon. But I mean that in all the best ways. It opens with the Toy Story characters actually watching it on the TV, as if to already set up, hey, this is meant to be like a Saturday morning cartoon. And that's exactly how it plays out. In the movie, Buzz Lightyear, played again by Tim Allen, is off again to fight the evil Emperor Zerg. Zerg wants to get this technology known as the Unimind. It's a device that the LGMs, you can guess what that stands for, use to communicate with one another to become the most efficient race ever. But Zerg captures the device and plans to use it for evil, turning everybody's minds as diabolical as his. 
So it's up to Buzz, of course, to go in and stop him, but the one downside is they want him to have a partner. But of course, he doesn't want a partner. Why? Because he lost his last partner, Warp, and the pain was just too near. So of course he turns away the others that try to come to his side. A ranger named Nova who's also a princess but doesn't like being a princess. A bumbling janitor who has dreams of adventure. And a nerdy robot who always has those clever one-liners. This setup is of course about as stock as you can get. But the thing is, with the way it's written, it's aware that it's stock, and it has fun with it. There's a lot of great comedic talent behind these characters, including Nicole Sullivan, Larry Miller, and Wayne Knight, who's practically unrecognizable as Zerk. I think they're distorting his voice a little bit, but whatever they're doing, they make it sound great. It's both kind of menacing, but super hilarious at the same time. You're telling me my plan. I already know my plan. I made up the plan. It's my plan. What I don't know is how close you are to accomplishing my plan! Oh, yeah, uh, kind of an outdoor voice there. <laughs> the atmosphere gives you what you're looking for, with spacemen and women traveling through space and shooting up aliens, but it also has this clever side to it. Rangers, condition status. Not good. Uh... Excellent, let's roll. The comedy is both mocking, but kind of paying homage to these sort of 80s Saturday morning tropes. Like the climax is stopping Zerg from pointing his death ray to the planet of orphans and widows. There's like a five minute conversation decade to getting nose rings. Why can't we have nose rings? Because nose rings are for punks, little mister. Well, if you can take on Zerg alone, I don't see why XR can't get a nose ring. I was just asking a question. I'm not the one getting a nose ring. And all these characters' egos do great at working off of each other, trying to show off, trying to be funny, and ultimately succeeding at the end, but just barely. It doesn't really have any twists or surprises, or at least none that you can't see coming a mile away. But again, it feels like that's the intention. It's trying to give us that silly version of Transformers or Thundercats or Silverhawks. Except there's a self-awareness that makes for a lot of funny comedy. I'd say the one nitpick I have in the entire thing is that Booster, the big jander guy, doesn't really seem to have a point. The other cadets definitely prove their worth, but this guy just sort of acts afraid and screams and I don't know. I get why he was there as the scaredy cat character, but I didn't really get why he was there in terms of the story. But again, story is not a big thing here. What is big is the adventure, the comedy, the characters, and they all do great. Again, in that cheesy Saturday morning way that they're obviously going for. If I was a little kid, I would love this. This is the exact show I would want to see looking at Buzz Lightyear in Toy Story. It feels like this is the show the toy was based on. These were the adventures that they made him out of. I'd say if you had even the tiniest interest in seeing this at all, you'll get your money's worth. Like I said, obviously for kids, but it has just the right amount of comedy, action, and charm. Give it a watch and have fun going to infinity and beyond. Mouse and the Three Musketeers, that is pretty much exactly what you get. Mickey, Donald, and Goofy all going off to save Princess Minnie so that evil Captain Pete can't take over the crown. Yeah, somehow kidnapping her makes him king. Yeah, this isn't really story based. The plot is. Oh, wait, no, that was pretty much it. Yeah, it's about as generic and old fashioned a cartoon plot for kids goes. So, is it any good? I. It's hard to pick on something that's obviously meant for, like, little, little kids. I mean, it's a Mickey Mouse directed dvd movie, what do you expect? Well, but again, I guess that's not fair. Mickey has been in some really good stuff. There's a great short he was in called The Prince and the Pauper. Fantasia is a masterpiece. Even that Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas had a lot of charm to it. This I don't really describe as having a lot of charm, but it's... harmless. Every character and motivation is exactly what you think it's going to be. Mickey is optimistic, but he dreams of being a Mouseketeer. <sighs> Did I really just say that? You know what I mean. Goofy is a doofus, but he wants to apply his brain. Donald is a coward and wants to learn how to be brave. And Minnie is a princess, so of course she wants to fall in love. There is nothing new or original in this. Even the songs are classical public domain tunes that they just put lyrics to. Some of them already had lyrics, they just add new ones. I guess it's good this teaches kids classical music, but it's music you're gonna hear everywhere anyway, it, I don't know. The animation is clearly trying and the backgrounds are clearly trying, but nothing really stands out as great. 
Everybody does exactly what you think they do. Everybody reacts exactly how you think they'd react. So why doesn't this work as well as, say, the Buzz Lightyear cartoon? Well, that one still threw in some good laughs, and it was creative. It had kind of a goofy story, but it also had some imagination to it. The best way I can describe this one is by looking at the opening and closing credits. You see this comic strip style? This was very popular back in the day. In fact, these Mickey Mouse comics are kind of these rarities. They're seen as this pure, innocent artwork of more simple times. They didn't have much depth. In fact, they have virtually no depth. But they were so simple and colorful that kids really loved it, and it's sort of carried over for some adults. This is pretty much the same thing. It's innocent, it's harmless, but I don't really see any reason to watch it either. It's fine for kids, I guess. But aside from the smoothness of the animation and some of the backgrounds, nothing really screams Disney top of the game. But again, it's a direct-to-DVD Mickey Mouse movie, but again! More effort has been put into those in the past, but again! It's not like no effort was put into this, but... Ah, uh, probably think it's more complicated than it needs to be. If you're an adult, it's unlikely you'll get into it at all. But if you're a little, little kid that just wants to see Mickey Mouse go on an adventure, it's energized, colorful, and harmless. Don't expect anything great, but honestly, you probably weren't anyway. You're probably just expecting a Mickey Mouse cartoon, and that's what you get, a really long Mickey Mouse cartoon. Fine for little boys and girls, but that's really about it. It's all for one and one for me. Let's finish up Disney December with Tinkerbell. Yeah, there's a strange while where Tinkerbell was extremely popular. It's weird because the character has been around for years and years, but only now did the popularity just explode. Was this movie the cause of it? Maybe. It opens literally with Tinkerbell's birth, which is kind of like what they say in the book, where a child laughs, that laugh goes to Neverland, and then suddenly a fairy is born. Only she's not born like a little baby, she's born fully grown. I guess it's like Pinocchio, where the personality is just intact. Oh, why am I analyzing it? It's fairy tales, and this is obviously made for little kids who just want to see Tinkerbell fly around, look pretty, do some magic, and... Yeah, that's about it. The story is pretty standard, but you can tell it's written for little children. Tinkerbell is looking for her place to belong, and she's put with the Tinker Fairies. Yeah, who would have thought? Tinkerbell is really good at tinkering. Putting things together, figuring out gears and such. Unfortunately, though, her inventions don't always work out that well, and that means that she can't join the group of fairies that leave Neverland and go into the other world. So Tinkerbell gets a group of fairies together and tries to have them teach her how to do various other things that can get her into the other world. Unfortunately, she doesn't seem very good at it. She's only good at tinkering and making stuff, and even then, she's not that great either. Through hard work and determination, she will make everything really bad. Yeah, it's one of those stories where she screws up everything for everyone, but she also finds a way to make it better in the end, and a nice little compromise is made. Actually, that is one of the few things I really admire about this movie, the message of compromise. That is to say, Tinkerbell eventually comes to terms with her gifts, but she also pushes really hard to get what she wants and what she feels is rightfully hers. I admire films like Wreck-It Ralph or Nightmare Before Christmas that sort of say, just be happy with what you have. But I also like stories like this, where it's be happy with what you have, but don't be afraid to go a little further too. Fight for what you really want. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't, and sometimes it's halfway in between, like what we have here. But is there anything really that gripping for adults in this? Not especially. This is something that's written for little, little kids, but for little, little kids, it's innocent enough. It definitely has a visual style. Some of the backgrounds are very nice. The everyday items they use from flowers and raindrops and such are pretty clever. And the movie is trying to have a certain weight to it. The music especially is trying to give this grand choir going, oh, make it seem really huge. And you know what? It's allowed. I mean, look at this animation style. This is clearly trying a lot harder than something like Twice Upon a Christmas. They want it to look whimsical. They want it to feel like these characters are alive, and for the most part, they do a good job. Outside of that, there's not really that much to get into for adults, although I do love this one scene when she's testing her equipment. <laughs> Why does that crack me up so much? <laughs> but aside from that, it's not incredibly smart, but it's not incredibly dumb either. It's a nice little innocent film to show your kids, and they'll get some creativity. There are slow moments, there's times where they need the emotion to set in, but there's also fast moments, and there's scenes where they throw in the little pop song and such. 
I'm definitely not going to put it on anytime soon, but if I had little kids and they wanted to watch this, I'd say it's a good thing to put on. I don't have nearly enough time to look at the dozens of sequels that came out afterwards. I know, it's ironic seeing how this was sequel month, but like the movie said, compromise. It's a good thing. And with that said, that wraps up Disney's Sember with the direct-to-DVD sequels. Was it as bad as I thought it was gonna be? Well, in some areas it was even worse. But in some areas it was actually okay, and surprisingly in others, I found myself having a good time. You can definitely tell which films were just rushed out and they didn't really care about and which ones they wanted to put the extra time and effort into, even when they didn't need to put in the extra time and effort. I'm not gonna act like any of these were great, but I was shocked to find those couple that were actually, well, not only tolerable, but some legitimately entertaining. And they were few, but I respected them. And the ones that were bad, like really bad, well, they'll bring us a lot of laughs and mockery and just how awful they are. At least I can say I saw them all and I gave them a fair shot, and though I was shocked with how bad some of them were, I was shocked by how good some of them were. I guess sometimes even when a company like Disney just wants to throw their table scraps at us, you can actually take those table scraps and turn it into a good meal. It doesn't happen all the time, but not enough times to get noticed. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this year's Disney December, and if you're like me, you're anticipating what Disney has next to offer. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next year.